The water was clear as air and so cold that when they clambered out, their bodies glowed bright pink all over, and her nipples were standing out as hard and dark as ripe olives. But the icy water had honed their appetites, and they sprinkled lemon juice on the hot succulent white flesh of the galjon, and wolfed it down with chunks of brown bread and salty yellow farm butter. Satiated at last, they sat back and Blaine looked at her. She wore only one of his navy blue roll-necked fisherman's jerseys, but the hem reached almost to her knees. She had piled her damp, unruly tangle of hair on top of her head and tied it there with a yellow ribbon. We could go for a walk, he suggested, or... She thought about that for a few seconds and then decided. I rather think I'll settle for the or. Your wish, madam, is my command, he replied courteously and stood over her to lift the heavy jersey off over her head. In the middle of the morning he lay flat on his back on the bunk, while Sontaine was propped on an elbow above him, tickling his lips and closed eyelids with a feather that she had plucked from the seam of one of the pillows. Blaine, she said softly, I am selling Belt of Raiden. He opened his eyes, caught her wrist, and sat up quickly. Selling? he demanded. Why? I have to, she answered simply. The estate, the house, and everything in it. But why, my darling? I know how much it means to you. Why sell it? Yes, Velt of Raiden means a great deal to me, she agreed. But the Harney mine means more. If I sell the estate, there is just a chance, a very small chance, that I will be able to save the mine. I didn't know, he said gently. I had no idea things were that bad. How could you know, my love? She caressed his face. Nobody else does. But I don't understand. The Harney mine, surely it is making profit sufficient... No, Blaine. Nobody is buying diamonds nowadays. Nobody is buying anything any more. This depression, this terrible depression. Our quota has been slashed. The prices we are being paid for our stones are less than half of what they were five years ago. The Harney mine is not quite breaking even. It is losing a small amount every month. But if I can hold on until the economy of the world turns around, she broke off. The only chance I have of doing that is by selling Belt of Raiden. That is all I have left to sell. That way I might be able to hold on until the middle of next year. And surely this terrible depression must be over by then. Yes, of course it will, he agreed readily. And then, after a pause... I have some money, Sontaine. She laid her fingers on his lips, smiled sadly and shook her head. He lifted her hand away from his mouth and insisted, If you love me, then you must let me help you. Our bargain, Blaine, she reminded him. Nobody else must be hurt. That money belongs to Isabella and the girls. It belongs to me, he said. And if I choose... Blaine, Blaine, she stopped him. A million pounds might save me now. A million pounds, do you have that much? Any lesser amount would be wasted, simply disappear into the bottomless pit of my debts. He shook his head slowly. So much. Then he admitted regretfully. No. I don't have a third part of that, Sontaine. Then we will not speak of it again, she told him firmly. Now, show me how to catch crayfish for dinner. I don't want to talk of anything unpleasant for the rest of our time together. There will be plenty of time for ugliness when I get home. On their last afternoon, they climbed the slope behind the shack, wading hand in hand through the bright banks of wild blooms. The pollen painted their legs the colour of saffron, 
and the bees rose in noisy swarms as they disturbed them, and then resettled as they passed on. Look, Blaine. See how every flower turns its head to follow the sun as it moves across the sky. I am like one of them, and you are my son, my love. They wandered along the slope, and Blaine plucked the choicest blooms and plaited them into a crown. He placed it on her head. I crown you queen of my heart, he intoned. And though he smiled when he said it, his eyes were serious. They made love lying on the mattress of wild flowers, crushing the stems and leaves beneath them, enveloped in the herby aroma of their juices and the perfume of their blooms. And afterwards, Sontaine asked him as she lay in his arms, Do you know what I am going to do? Tell me, he invited, his voice drowsy from their loving. I am going to give them something to talk about, she said. A year from now, they may say, Sontaine Courtney went out, but they'll have to add, but she went out in style. What do you propose? Instead of the usual Christmas hijinks, I'm going to throw a bash to end all bashes. Open house at Belt of Raiden for a week. Champagne and dancing every night. It will also throw the creditors off the scent for a while longer, he grinned at her. But I don't suppose you had thought of that, had you? You devious little vixen. That's not the only reason, said Sontaine. It will give us an excuse to be together in public. You will be there, won't you? Well, that depends. He was serious again, and they both knew it depended on Isabella. But he did not say it. I'll have to find a pretty good excuse. I'll give you an excuse, she said excitedly. I'll make it a polo week, a 20 goal tournament. I'll invite teams from all over the country, all the top players. You are the national captain. You could not reasonably refuse, could you? I don't see how, he agreed. Talk about devious. And he shook his head in admiration. It will give you a chance to meet Sassa. I told you he has been pestering me ever since he heard that I knew you. Well, that I'd enjoy, he said. You will have to put up with a bit of hero worship. You could invite a few junior teams, Blaine suggested. Give them a tournament of their own. I'd like to watch your son ride. Oh, Blaine, what a wonderful idea. She clapped her hands excitedly. My poor darling, it will probably be Chasseur's last chance to ride his own ponies. Of course, I will have to sell them when I sell Velt of Raiden. The shadows were in her eyes again for a moment, but then she rallied, and her eyes sparkled. But as I said, we'll go out in style. Chasseur's team, the Velt of Raiden invitation, under 16 years, had won through to the final round of the Junior League, mostly by virtue of their handicap allowance. Chasseur was the only plus player. Of the other three members of the team, two were scratch handicaps, and the third was a minus one. However, they had finally come up against the Natal Juniors, four of the top youngsters, all of them two and three goal players except their captain. Max Thunison had only made the age limit by a few months. He was rated five goals, the best in Africa for his age, with height and weight in the saddle, a good eye and a powerful wrist. He used all these advantages to the full, adopting a hard, driving style of play. Chasseur was the next best-rated player in the country, at four goals. But he lacked the older boy's weight and strength. Max was backed by his strong teammates, and all Shasha's skill and determination were not sufficient to prevent his team crumbling under the onslaught, leaving Shasha virtually unaided to try and stem the rout. In five chuckers, 
Max had pounded in nine goals against Schasser's best efforts in defence, wiping out the Welt of Raiden's team's handicap start, so that on handicap the teams were all square as they came in to change ponies for the last chucker. Schasser flung himself out of the saddle, his face flushed with exertion and frustration and anger, and shouted at his chief groom, Abel, you didn't tighten the girth properly. The coloured groom bobbed his head nervously. You checked it, Master Shasser. Don't answer back, man. But he wasn't even looking at Abel. He was glaring across the field at the Natal pony lines, where Max the Unison was surrounded by a cluster of his admirers. I'll ride Tiger Shark for this chucker, he shouted at Abel over his shoulder. You said plum pudding, Abel suggested. And now I say Tiger Shark. Change the saddles and check the bandages on his forelegs. Plum Pudding was a small pony, getting a little on in years and round in the middle, but still with an uncanny instinct to judge the run of the ball and set Shasser up for the shot. The two of them had developed a marvellous rapport. However, as befitted his advancing years, Plum Pudding was becoming cautious. He no longer enjoyed a heavy ride-off and flinched from putting his plump shoulder to that of another pony at full gallop. Chasser had seen that at the other lines, Max Thunison had called for his black stallion, Nemesis. On this pony, he had terrorised the junior league over the past four days, riding so cunningly close to foul play that the umpires had difficulty br bringing him to book. He had succeeded in frightening most of the young, lighter riders off the line, even when they had the right of way, and riding off those who had the courage to stand up to him with such sadistic vigour that there had been two or three close calls, even one accident, when little Tabby Vermulen from the Transvaal had been brought down so heavily that he had broken his wrist and dislocated his shoulder. Come on, Abel, don't just stand there. Get the saddle on Tiger Shark. Tiger Shark was a young bay stallion with only a year's schooling behind him. An ugly animal with a hammer head and immensely powerful shoulders, which gave him hump-backed appearance. His temperament was equally unattractive. He kicked and bit without provocation or warning, was sometimes almost unmanageable, and he had a vicious aggressive streak that seemed to rejoice in the command to barge in for the ride off. He had never yet flinched from heavy contact. In any other circumstances, Shasser would have stayed with Plum Pudding. But Max had saddled Nemesis, and Shasser could guess what was coming. The shaft of his stick had cracked in the final seconds of the last chucker, and he unwound the strap from his wrist and threw it on the ground and called across to his number two as he went to the wagon for a replacement. Bunty! You must come up faster and move inside for my cross. Don't keep falling back, man. Chesser broke off, becoming aware of the hectoring tone of his own voice, as he realised that Colonel Blaine Malcolmus, the national captain and Chesser's particular demigod, was watching him. He had come up silently and was now leaning against the rear wheel of the wagon, one ankle crossed over the other, his arms folded over his chest, the wide-brimmed Panama hat canted over one eye, and an enigmatic half-smile on his wide mouth. Shasser was sure that it showed disapproval, and he tried to smooth over his scowl. Hello, sir. We're taking a bit of a drubbing, I'm afraid. And he forced a rueful and unconvincing smile. No matter what they taught you at Bishop's, he didn't like losing, not one little bit. Far from being censorious of Shasser's bad temper, Blaine was delighted with it. The will to win was the single most important asset, and not only on the polo ground. He had not been sure that Shasser Courtney had it. For a person of his age, he covered up very well. Offering a beautiful but urbane face to his elders, 
deferring attentively to them with the old-fashioned manners drummed into him by his mother and his school, and remaining at all times difficult to fathom. However, Blaine had been watching him carefully over the last four days. He had seen that Chasser had a strong, natural seat on a horse, a marvellous eye, and a fluid stroke hinging on a powerful wrist. He was fearless and full of dash, which often meant he was penalised for cutting across the line and for other dangerous play. But Blaine knew that with experience he would learn to disguise his hard play and not make it so apparent to the umpires. The other requirements for a top international class player were great stamina, which would come with age, dedicated application and experience. This last item was so vitally important that a player only reached the high noon of his career at 40 years or later. Blaine himself was only just peaking and could look forward to another 10 years at the top. Chassa Courtney had promise, and now Blaine had seen in him the will to win and his bitter anger at the thought of defeat. He smiled as he remembered his own reply when, at that age, his father had told him, Blaine, you must learn to be a better loser. He had replied, from the benefit of all sixteen years of acquired wisdom, Yes, sir, but I don't intend to get in enough practice to become really good at it. Blaine stifled the smile and spoke softly. Chasser, can we have a word, please? Of course, sir. Shasa hurried to his summons, pulling off his hard cap respectfully. You're letting Max rattle you, Blaine said quietly. You've been using your noggin up to now. In the first four chuckers, you held them to four goals. But in the last chucker, Max knocked in five. Yes, sir. Shasa scowled again unconsciously. Think, lad, said Blaine. What has changed? Chassa shook his head and then blinked as it dawned on him. He's pulling me across onto his offside. Right, Blaine nodded. He's taking you on his strong side. Nobody has had a go at him from his other side, not once in five days. Change sides with Bunty and come at him on the near side. Come in steeply and barge him hard, just once. Something tells me young Max isn't going to like his own medicine. I think only one dose will be necessary. Nobody has yet seen the true colour of Master Thunison's liver. My guess is that it has a streak of yellow in it. You mean foul him, sir? Chasser stared at him wonderingly. All his life he had been coached in the games of young gentlemen. This was the first time he had received this type of advice. Perish the thought, and Blaine winked at him. Let's just learn to be good losers, shall we? They had established this peculiar accord from the moment Sontaine had first introduced them. Of course, Blaine's reputation had made it easier for him. He had Chasser's respect and admiration before they had even met, and given Blaine's experience as an officer and politician in the art of bending others to his will, it had been a simple matter for him to make the most of his advantage with one so inexperienced and gullible. Besides that, Blaine had truly and deeply wanted it to be good between them not only for the reason that Chasser was the son of the woman he loved, but because the boy was comely and charismatic, because he was quick-witted and had proved himself fearless and dedicated, and because Blaine did not have, and knew he never would have, a son of his own. Stick with him, Chasser, and play him at his own game, he ended his advice. And Chasser smiled, his face radiant with pleasure and determination. Thank you, sir. He clapped his hard hat on his head and strode away, the shaft of his mallet over his shoulder, the back of his white breeches stained brown with dubbin from the saddle, 
and the sweat drying in salty white crystals between the shoulders of his bright yellow jersey. Bunty, we're changing sides, he called. And when Abel led Tiger Shark up, Shasha punched his shoulder lightly. You are right, you old thunder. I did check the girth myself. He made a show of doing it again, and Abel grinned delightedly when Shasa looked up from the girth buckle and told him, Now you can't blame me again. Without touching the stirrups, he swung up into Tiger Shark's back. Blaine pushed himself away from the wagon wheel and sauntered back towards the grandstand his eyes instinctively sweeping the throng for the bright yellow of Sontaine's hat. She was in a circle of males. Blaine recognised Sir Gary Courtney and General Smuts amongst them, together with three other influential men, a banker, a cabinet minister in the Herzog government, and Max Thunison's father. A pretty average sort of bunch for Madame Courtney. Blaine winced at the jealous pang he could not harden himself to accept. Sontaine's invitations had been sent out not only to the best players in the country, but to all the most influential and important men in every other field. Politicians, academics, great landowners and mining magnates, businessmen and newspaper editors, even a few artists and writers. The Chateau of Veltevraden was unable to house them all, and she had taken over every room at the neighbouring Alphen Hotel, once also part of the Cleote family estate, to accommodate the overflow. Together with all her local guests, there were well over 200 from out of town. She had chartered a special train to bring down the up-country contingent and their ponies, and for five days the entertainment had been continuous. Junior League polo in the mornings, an al fresco banquet at lunchtime, senior polo in the afternoon, followed by an elaborate buffet dinner and all-night dancing. Half a dozen bands played in relays, providing non-stop music through the days and nights. In between, there were cabaret turns and fashion shows, a charity sale of art and rare wines, another sale of yelling thoroughbreds, a concours d'élégance for motor vehicles and lady drivers, a treasure hunt, a fancy dress evening, tennis, croquet and bridge tournaments, show jumping, a motorcyclist on a wall of death, punch and judy for the children, and a team of professional nannies to keep the little ones occupied. And I am the only one who knows what it is all about. Blaine looked up the stand at her. It's crazy and, in a way, immoral. It's no longer her money to spend. But I love her for her courage in the midst of misfortune. Sontaine sensed him watching, and her head turned quickly to him. For a moment they stared at each other, the distance between them not muting the intensity of their gaze. Then she turned back to General Smuts and laughed gaily at what he was saying. Blaine longed to go to her, just to be near to her, just to smell her perfume and listen to that husky voice with its touch of French accent. But instead, he strode determinedly across the front of the stand to where Isabella sat in her wheelchair. This was the first day that Isabella had felt strong enough to attend the tournament, and Sontaine had arranged for a special ramp to be built, to allow her wheelchair to reach the first tier of seats in the stand for a view of the field. Isabella's silver-haired mother sat on one side of her, and she was surrounded by four of her close girlfriends and their husbands. But her two daughters came streaking down from the stand as soon as they saw Blaine, holding up their skirts to the knees with one hand and cramming their wide-brimmed, beribboned straw hats onto their heads with the other, while they gabbled shrilly for his attention and then hopped along on each side of him, clinging to his hands and dragging him up to his seat beside Isabella. Dutifully, Blaine kissed the pale, silky cheek that Isabella offered him. The skin was cool, and he caught a whiff of laudanum on her breath. The pupils of her large eyes were dilated from the drug, giving them a touchingly vulnerable look. 
I missed you, darling, she whispered, and it was the truth. The moment Blaine had left her, she had looked around desperately to find Santaine Courtney, her torment only easing a little when she saw Santaine surrounded by admirers higher in the stand. I had to chat to the boy, Blaine excused himself. Are you feeling better? Thank you. The laudanum is working now. She smiled up at him, so tragic and brave, that he stooped once more and kissed her forehead. Then, as he straightened, he glanced guiltily in Santaine's direction, hoping that she had not noticed that spontaneous gesture of tenderness. But she was watching him, and she looked away quickly. Papa, the teams are coming out. Tara tugged him down into his seat. Come on, Belt of Raiden, she shrieked, and Blaine could concentrate on the match rather than his own dilemma. Changing sides, Chasser led his team past the grandstand, cantering easily down the sideline, standing in the stirrups to adjust the chin strap of his cap, and searching for Blaine in the stand. They caught each other's eye and Shassa grinned as Blaine gave him a laconic thumbs up. Then he dropped back into the saddle and swung Tiger Sharp around to face the Natal team as they rode out in their white breeches and caps, black boots and black short-sleeved shirts, looking tough and expert. Max Theunison frowned as he realised that Shassa had changed sides and he circled out and flashed a hand signal to his number two on the far side of the field, and then came back around again just as the umpire trotted to the centre and dropped the white bamboo root ball. The last chucker opened with a confused scrappy melee, with hacked shots missing and the ball trampled and rolling under the pony's hooves. Then it popped clear, and Bunty leaned out of the saddle and hit his first good shot of the match a high forehand drive that lofted well upfield, and his pony went after it instinctively, bearing Bunty along on the line whether he liked it or not. It was Bunty's shot, so he had the right of way, and his pony came in perfectly to set him up. But Max the Unison wheeled Nemesis, and the black stallion was at full gallop within two strides. Max's father had not paid a thousand pounds for nothing, and the big powerful horse came down on Bunty like an avalanche. Bunty looked over his shoulder, and Shassa saw him blanch. Your line, Bunty! Shassa screamed to encourage him. Stay on it! But at the same time, he saw Max deliberately press his toe into the back of the stallion's gleaming shoulder, and Nemesis altered his angle. It was a dangerous and menacing attack, and if Bunty had stood up to it, it would have been a blatant foul. But these tactics of terror worked yet again, and Bunty sawed his pony's head frantically and broke away, giving up the line. Max swept onto it triumphantly, gathering himself and leaning out of the saddle, lifting his stick high in the foreswing, and concentrating all his attention on the white ball that jumped and kicked over the turf directly ahead of him, setting up to take it on the backhand. He had overlooked Shassa on his near side, and was unprepared for the blazing burst of speed with which Tiger Shark responded to the drive of Shassa's heels, as he came in at a legitimate angle for the ride off. 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 These are desperate times, Blaine. Smuts was speaking softly. Storm clouds are gathering all around us. We need a united people. We need a strong coalition cabinet, not a parliament split by party differences. Our economy is tottering on the brink. The gold mining industry is in jeopardy. At present costs, many of the older mines are already closing down. Others will follow. And when they do... It will mean the end of the South Africa that we know and love. In addition to that, the price of wool and diamonds, our other major exports, have crashed. Blaine nodded soberly. 
All these factors were the basis of nationwide concern. I don't have to emphasize the findings of the Wage Commission, Smuts went on. One fifth of our white population has been plunged by drought and primitive farming methods into abject poverty. Twenty percent of our productive lands have been ruined by erosion and abuse, probably permanently. The poor whites, Blaine murmured. A great mass of itinerant beggars and starvelings, unemployed and untrained, without skills, without hope. Then we have our blacks, split by twenty tribal divisions, flocking in from the rural districts in search of the good life, de lekalu, and swelling the ranks of the unemployed, finding instead of the good life, crime and illicit liquor and prostitution, building up a pervading discontent, conceiving a fine contempt for our laws, and discovering for the first time the sweet attractions of political power. Oh, that is a problem we haven't even begun to address or attempt to understand, Blaine agreed. Let us pray our children and our grandchildren do not curse us for our neglect. Let us pray indeed, Smuts echoed. And while we do so, let us look beyond our own borders for a moment to the chaos which engulfs the rest of the world. He stabbed at the earth with his cane to mark each point as he made it. In America, the system of credit has collapsed and trade with Europe and the rest of the world has come to a standstill. Armies of the poor and dispossessed roam aimlessly across the continent. He stabbed the point of the cane into the turf. In Germany, the Weimar Republic is collapsing after ruining the economy. 150 billion Weimar marks to one of the old gold marks, wiping out the nation's savings. Now, from the ashes, has risen a new dictatorship, founded in blood and violence, which has upon it the stench of immense evil. He struck the earth again, angrily. In Russia, a ravening monster is murdering millions of his own countrymen. Japan is in the throes of anarchy. The military have run riot, cutting down the nation's elected rulers, seizing Manchuria and slaughtering the unfortunate inhabitants by hundreds of thousands, threatening to walk out of the League of Nations when the rest of the world protests. Once again, the cane hissed as he slashed at the lush Kikuyu grass. There has been a run on the Bank of England, Great Britain forced off the gold standard, and from the vault of history the ancient curse of anti-Semitism has escaped once more and stalks the civilised world. Smut stopped and faced Blaine squarely. Everywhere we turn there is disaster and mortal danger. I will not attempt to profit from it, and in so doing divide this suffering land. No, Blaine. Coalition and cooperation, not conflict. How did it all go wrong so swiftly, Ubas? Blaine asked softly. It seems just yesterday that we were prosperous and happy. In South Africa... A man can be filled with hope at dawn and sick with despair by noon. Smuts was silent for a moment and then he roused himself. I need you, Blaine. Do you want time to think about it? Blaine shook his head. No need. You can count on me, Ubas. I knew I could, said Smuts. Blaine looked beyond him to where Sontaine sat under the oaks and tried to hide his jubilation and suppress the sense of shame that underlaid it. Shame that, unlike this saintly little man before him, he was to profit from the agony of his country and the civilised world. Shame that only now, out of despair and hardship, he would achieve his cherished ambition of cabinet rank. Added to that, he would be returning to the Cape, coming in from the desert lands to this lush and beautiful place, coming into where Sontaine Courtney was. Then his gaze flicked 
to the thin, pale woman in the wheelchair, her beauty fading under the onslaught of pain and drugs, and his guilt and shame balanced almost perfectly his jubilation. But Smuts was speaking again. I will be staying on here as a guest at Veltivraden for the next four days, Blaine. Sir Gary has bullied me into agreeing to allow him to write my biography, and I will be working with him on the first draft. At the same time, I will be conducting a series of secret meetings with Barry Herzog to agree the final details of the coalition. This is an ideal place for us to talk, and I would be obliged if you could keep yourself available. I will almost certainly be calling upon you. Of course. With an effort, Blaine set his own emotions aside. I will be here as long as you need me. Do you want me to submit my resignation to the administrator's office? Draft the letter, Smuts agreed. I will explain your reasons to Herzog, and you can hand it to him in person. Blaine glanced at his watch, and the old general said quickly, Yes, you will have to prepare for your match. This frivolity, in the midst of such dire events, is rather like fiddling while Rome burns, but one must keep up appearances. I have even agreed to present the prizes. Sontaine Courtney is a persuasive lady. So, I hope we will meet later, at the prize-giving, when I hand you the cup. It was a close thing. But the Cape A team, led by Blaine Malcolmus, held off the most determined efforts of the Transvaal A in the final match of the tournament to win by three goals. Immediately afterwards, all the teams gathered at the foot of the grandstand, where the array of silver cups was set out on the prize table. But there was an awkward pause in the proceedings. One team was missing, the junior champions. Where is Chassa? Sontaine demanded in a low but furious voice of Cyril Slain, who was the tournament organiser. He flapped his hands and looked helpless. He promised me he would be here. If this is his surprise, with an effort Sontaine hid her anger behind a gracious smile for the benefit of her interested guests. Well, that is it. We begin without them and she took her place on the front tier of the stand beside the general and held up both hands for attention. General Smuts, ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests and dear friends. She faltered and looked around uncertainly, her voice overlaid by the drone in the air, a sound that rose steadily in volume, becoming a roar, and every face in the crowd was lifted to the sky, searching, some puzzled, others amused or uneasy. Then suddenly, over the oaks at the far end of the polo field, flashed the wings of a low-flying aircraft. Sontaine recognised it as a pusmoth, a small single-engine machine. It banked steeply towards the grandstand and came straight at them, no more than head high as it raced across the field. Then, when it seemed it would fly straight into the crowded stand, the nose lifted sharply and it roared over their heads as half the spectators ducked instinctively and a woman screamed. In the moment that it flashed over her, Sontaine saw Chasseur's laughing face in the side window of the aircraft's cabin and the flicker of his hand as he waved. And instantly she was transported back over the years through time and space. The face was no longer Chasseur's, but that of Michael Courtney, his father. In her mind, the machine was no longer blue and streamlined, but had assumed the gaunt, old-fashioned lines, the double deck of wings and wire riggings and the open cockpit and daubed yellow paintwork of a wartime scout plane. It banked around in a wide circle, appearing once more over the tops of the oaks, and she stood rigid with shock, and her soul was riven by a silent scream of anguish as she watched again the shot-riddled yellow scout plane trying to clear the great beech trees below the chateau of Mortom, its engines stuttering and missing. Michael! She screamed his name in her head, 
and it was like a blinding flash of agony, as once again she watched his mortally wounded machine hit the top branches of the tall copper beech, and cartwheel, wing over wing, as it fell out of the air and struck the earth, to collapse in a welter of broken struts and canvas. Again, she saw the flames bloom like poisonous, beautiful flowers, and leap high from the shattered machine, and the dark smoke roll across the lawns towards her, and the body of the man in the open cockpit twist and writhe and blacken, as the orange flames sucked upwards, and the heat danced in glassy mirage, and greasy black smoke, and filled her ears with drumming thunder. Michael! Her jaws were locked closed, her teeth aching at the pressure, and her lips were rimmed with the ice of horror, so that the name could not escape from between them. Then miraculously the image faded, and she saw instead the small blue machine settle sedately onto the green turf of the polar field, its tail dropping onto the skid, the engine beat dwindling to a polite burbling murmur as it swung around at the far end of the field, and then taxied back towards the stand, the wings rocking slightly. It stopped below them, and the engine cut out with a final hiccup of blue smoke from the exhausts. The doors on each side of the cabin were flung open, and out tumbled Shasser Courtney and his three grinning teammates. It amazed her that they had all crammed into that tiny cockpit, Surprise, they howled. Surprise, surprise. And there was laughter and applause and whistles and catcalls from the stand. An aircraft was still a marvellous novelty, able to attract the attention of even such a sophisticated gathering as this. Probably not more than one in five of them had ever flown in one, and this unexpected and noisy arrival had created an excited, laughing mood so that the applause and comment was loud and raucous as Chasseur led his team up to the prize table to accept the silver cup from General Smuts. The pilot of the blue aircraft climbed out of the left-hand door, a stocky, bald-headed figure, and Santaine glared at him venomously. She had not known that Jock Murphy included flying among his assorted accomplishments, but she determined that he would rule this prank. She had always done all she could to discourage Shasser's interest in aircraft and flying, but it had been difficult. Shasser kept a photograph of his father in flying gear beside his bed, and a replica of the SE-5A fighter plane hung from the ceiling of his bedroom. Over the last few years, his questions about flying and his father's military feats had become more insistent and purposeful. She should have been warned by this, of course, but she had been so preoccupied, and it had never occurred to her that he might take to flying without consulting her. Looking back, she realised that she had been deliberately ignoring the possibility, deliberately avoiding thinking about it, and now the shock was all the more unpleasant. With the silver cup in his hands... Chassa ended his short acceptance speech with the specific assurance. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you might have thought that Jock Murphy was flying the Puss Moth. He was not. He wasn't even touching the controls, were you? He looked across at the bald-headed instructor who shook his head in collaboration. There you are, Chassa gloated. You see, I have decided that I am going to be a flyer just like my dad. Sontaine did not join in the clapping and laughter. As suddenly as they had arrived and transformed the life of Belt of Raiden, the hundreds of guests had gone, leaving only the ruined turf of the polo ground, the litter and the mountains of empty champagne bottles and piles of dirty linen in the laundry. Santaine was left also with a feeling of anticlimax. Her last flourish had been made, the last shot in her arsenal fired. And on the Saturday, the mail ship docked in Table Bay and brought them an uninvited but unwelcome visitor. 
damn fellow reminds me of an undertaker standing in for the tax collector, Sir Gary huffed, and took General Smuts off to the gun room, which he always used as a study when he visited Velt of Raiden. The two of them were immersed in the initial consultations for the biography and did not appear again until lunchtime. The visitor came down to breakfast just as Santaine and Chasser arrived back from their early morning gallop, rosy-cheeked and starving. He was examining the hallmarks on the silver cutlery as they entered the dining room arm in arm through the double doors, laughing at one of Chasser's sallies. However, the mood was instantly shattered, and Santaine bit her lip and sobered when she saw him. May I introduce my son, Michael Chasser Courtney? Chasser, this is Mr. Davenport from London. How do you do, sir? Welcome to Velter Raiden. Davenport looked at Chasser with the same appraising stare with which he had been examining the silver. It means well satisfied, Chasser explained. From the Dutch, you know. Velt of Raiden. Mr. Davenport is from Sotheby's, Chasser. Santaine filled the awkward pause. He has come to advise me on some of our paintings and furniture. Oh, jolly good, Chasser enthused. Have you seen this, sir? Chasser pointed out the landscape in soft oils above the sideboard. It's my mother's favourite. Painted on the estate where she was born. Mordom, near Arras. Davenport adjusted his steel-framed spectacles and leaned over the sideboard for a closer view, so that his considerable stomach drooped into the salver of fried eggs and left a greasy splotch on his waistcoat. Signed, 1875, he said somberly. His best period. It's by a chap called Sisley, Chasser volunteered helpfully. Alfred Sisley. He is quite a well-known artist, isn't he, Mater? Cherie, I think Mr. Davenport knows who Alfred Sisley is. But Davenport wasn't listening. We could get five hundred pounds, he muttered and pulled a notebook from his inner pocket to make an entry. A fine dusting of dandruff descended from his lank locks at the movement and sprinkled the shoulders of his dark suit. Five hundred? Sontaine demanded unhappily. I paid considerably more than that for it. She poured a cup of coffee. She had never taken to these huge English breakfasts, and she carried it to the head of the table. That is as may be, Mrs. Courtney. We had a better example of his work on auction only last month, Les Clues de Marly, and it didn't reach the very modest reserve we placed on it. Buyer's market, I'm afraid. Very much a buyer's market. Oh, don't worry, sir. Chasser piled eggs onto his plate and crowned them with a reef of crispy bacon. It's not for sale. My mother would never sell it, would you, Mater? Davenport ignored him and carried his own plate to the vacant seat beside Sontaine. Now, the Van Gogh in the front salon is another matter, he told her, as he launched into the smoked kippers with more enthusiasm than he had shown for anything since his arrival. With his mouth full, he read from the notebook. Green and violet wheat field... Furrows lead the eye to golden halos around the huge orb of the rising sun high in the picture. Hm. He closed the book. There is quite a vogue for Van Gogh in America, even in this soft market. Can't tell you whether it would last, of course. Can't stand him myself. But I will have the picture photographed and send copies to a dozen of our most important clients in the United States. I think we can bank on four to five thousand pounds. Chasser had laid down his knife and fork and was staring from Davenport to his mother with a puzzled and troubled expression. I think we should talk about this later, Mr. Davenport, Sontaine intervened hurriedly. I have set aside the rest of the day for you, but let us enjoy our breakfast now. 
The rest of the meal passed in silence. But when Chassa pushed his plate away, half finished, Santaine rose with him. Where are you going, Chéri? The stables. The blacksmith is reshoeing two of my ponies. I'll walk down with you, she said. They took the path along the bottom wall of the Huguenot vineyard, where Santaine's best wine grapes were grown, and around the back of the old slave quarters. Both of them were silent, Chassa waiting for her to speak, and Santaine trying to find the words to tell him. Of course, there was no gentle way of saying it, and she had delayed too long already. Her procrastination had only made it more difficult for her now. At the gate of the stable yard, she took his arm and turned into the plantation. That man, she began, and then broke off and started again. Uh, Sotheby's is the foremost form of auctioneers in the world. They specialise in works of art. I know, he smiled condescendingly. I'm not a complete ignoramus mater. She drew him down onto the oak bench that stood at the edge of the spring. Sweet crystal water burbled out of a tiny rocky grotto and splashed down amongst ferns and green moss-covered boulders into the brick-lined pool at their feet. The trout in the pool, as long and as thick as Chassa's forearm, came nosing up to their feet, swirling hopefully for their feed. Chassa, chérie, she said, he has come here to sell Belty Braden for us. She said it clearly and loudly, and immediately the enormity of it came down upon her with the brutal force of a falling oak tree. And she sat numb and broken beside him, feeling herself shrinking and shriveling, giving in at last to despair. You mean the paintings? Chassa asked carefully. Not just the paintings. The furniture, the carpets, and the silver. She had to stop to draw breath and control the trembling of her lips. The chateau, the estate, your ponies, everything. He was staring at her, unable to comprehend it. He had lived at Beltivraden since he was four years old as far back as he could remember. Chassa, we have lost it all, she said. I have tried since the robbery to hold it together. I was not able to do it. It's gone, Chassa. We are selling Belt of Raiden to pay off our debts. There will be nothing left after that. Her voice was cracking again, and she touched her lips to still them before she went on. We aren't rich any more, Chassa. It's all gone. We are ruined. Completely ruined. She stared at him, waiting for him to revile her, waiting for him to break as she was about to break. But instead, he reached for her, and after a moment the stiffness went out of her shoulders, and she sagged against him and clung to him for comfort. We are poor, Chassa. And she sensed him struggling to take it all in, trying to find words to express his confused feelings. You know, Mater, he said at last, I know some poor people, some of the boys at school. Their parents are pretty hard up, and they don't seem to mind too much. Most of them are jolly good chaps. It might not be too bad, once we get used to being poor. I'll never get used to it, she whispered fiercely. I will hate it, every moment of it. And so will I, he said as fiercely. If only I were old enough. If only I could help you. She left Chassa at the blacksmith's shop and returned slowly, stopping often to chat with her coloured folk, the women coming to the stable doors of the cottages with their babies on their hips to greet her, the men straightening up from their labours, grinning with pleasure, for they had become her family. 
To part with them would be more painful even than giving up her carefully accumulated treasures. At the corner of the vineyard, she climbed over the stone wall and wandered between the rows of lovingly pruned vines, on which the bunches of new grapes already hung weightily, green and hard as musket balls, flowery with bloom. And she reached up and took them in her cupped hands as though it was a gesture of farewell and found that she was weeping. She had been able to contain her tears while she had been with Shasa, but now she was alone. Her grief and desolation overwhelmed her, and she stood amongst her vines and wept. Despair drained her and eroded her resolve. She had worked so hard, had been alone so long, and now, in ultimate failure, she was tired, so tired that her bones ached and she knew that she did not have the strength to start all over again. She knew she was beaten, and that from now on her life would be a sad and sorry thing, a grinding daily struggle to maintain her pride while she was reduced to the position of a mendicant. For dearly as she loved Gary Courtney, it would be his charity on which she must rely from now on, and her whole being quailed at the prospect. For the very first time in her life, she could not find either the will or the courage to go on. It would be so good to lie down and close her eyes. A strong desire came upon her, the longing for peace and silence. I wish it was all over, she thought, that there was nothing, no more striving and worrying and hoping. The longing for peace became irresistible, filled her soul, obsessed her, so that as she left the vineyard and entered the lane, she quickened her step. It will be like sleeping, sleeping with no dreams. She saw herself lying on a satin pillow, eyes closed, tranquil and calm. She was still in breeches and riding boots so that she could lengthen her stride, and as she crossed the lawns, she was running and she flung open the French doors to her study, and, panting wildly, ran to her desk and tore open the drawer. The pistols had been a gift from Sir Gary. They were in a fitted case of royal blue pigskin, with her name engraved on a brass plaque on the lid. They were a matched pair, handmade by Beretta of Italy for a lady, engraved with exquisite gold inlay, and the mother-of-pearl butts were set with small diamonds from the Harney mine. She selected one of the weapons and broke it open. Every chamber was loaded, and she snapped it closed and cocked the hammer. Her hands were steady, and her breathing had eased. She felt very calm and detached as she lifted the pistol, placed the muzzle to her temple, and took up the slack in the trigger with her forefinger. She seemed to be standing outside herself, looking on almost without emotion other than a faint remorse, at the waist, and a gentle sense of pity for herself. Poor Sontaine, she thought, what an awful way for it all to end. And she looked across the room at the gilt-framed mirror, there were tall vases set on each side of the glass, filled with fresh, long-stemmed yellow roses from the gardens, so that her image was framed within blooms, as though she were laid out in her coffin, and her face was pale as death. I look like a corpse, she said it aloud, and at the words her longing for oblivion changed instantly to a sickening self-disgust. She lowered the pistol and stared at her image in the mirror, and she saw the hot coals of anger begin to burn in her cheeks. No, merd, she almost shrieked at herself, you don't get out of it that easily. She opened the pistol 
and spilled the brass-cased cartridges onto the carpet, threw the weapon onto the blotter and strode from the room. The coloured maids heard the heels of her riding boots cracking on the marble treads of the circular staircase and lined up at the door to her suite, smiling happily and bobbing their curtsies. Lizzie, you lazy child, haven't you run my bath yet? Santaine demanded, and the two maids rolled their eyes at each other. Then Lily scampered for the bathroom in a convincing pantomime of obedience and duty, while the pretty little second maid followed Santaine to her dressing room, picking up the clothing that she deliberately dropped on the floor as she went. Gladys, you go and make sure Lily runs it deep and hot, she ordered. And the two of them were standing expectantly beside the huge marble tub as Santaine came through in a yellow silk robe and tested the water with one finger. Lily, do you want to make soup out of me? she demanded, and Lily grinned happily. The water was exactly the right temperature, and Santaine's question was acknowledgement of that, a private joke between them. Lily had the bath crystals ready and sprinkled a careful measure on the steaming water. Here, give it to me, Santaine ordered, and emptied half the jar into the bath. No more half measures. Santaine watched the bubbles foam up over the rim of the tub and slide onto the marble floor with a perverse satisfaction. And the two maids dissolved into giggles at this craziness and fled from the room as Santaine threw off the robe and, gasping with the exquisite agony of the heat, settled chin-deep in the foaming water. As she lay there, the image of the pearl-handled pistol reformed in her mind, but she drove it forcefully away. One thing you have never been, Santaine Courtney, is a coward, she told herself. And when she returned to her dressing room, she selected a dress of gay summer colours, and she was smiling as she came down the stairs. Davenport and Cyril Slane were waiting for her. This is going to take a long time, gentlemen, she said. Let us begin. Every single item in the huge mansion had to be numbered and described, the value estimated, the more important pieces photographed, and everything entered laboriously into the draft catalogue. All this had to be completed before Davenport went back to England on the mailboat in ten days' time. He would return in three months to conduct the actual sale. When the time came for Davenport to leave, Santaine surprised them all when she announced her intention of accompanying him around the mountain to the mail ship dock, a duty which would normally have fallen to Cyril. The sailing of the mail ship was one of the exciting events of the Cape Town social calendar, and the liner swarmed with passengers and the dozens of guests who had come to wish them bon voyage. At the first-class entry port, Santaine checked the passenger list and found the entry under M. Malcolmus, Mrs. I, cabin A-16. Malcolmus, Miss T., Cabin A-17. Malcolmus, Miss M. Cabin A-17. Blaine's family was sailing as planned. By agreement, she had not seen him since the last day of the polo tournament, and surreptitiously she searched for him now through the smoking saloons and lounges of the liner's first-class section. She could not find him and realised that he was probably in Isabella's suite. The idea of their intimate seclusion galled her, and she wanted desperately to go up to cabin A-16 on the boat deck on the pretext of saying farewell to Isabella, but really to prevent Blaine being alone with her for another minute. Instead, she sat in the main lounge and watched Mr Davenport demolishing pink gins while she smiled and nodded at her acquaintances and exchanged banalities with those friends who paraded through the liner's public cabins, determined to see and be seen. She noted with grim satisfaction the warmth and respect of the greetings and attention showered upon her. 
It was clear that the wild extravagance of the polo tournament had served its purpose and allayed suspicions of her financial straits. As yet, no rumours had been set free to ravage her position and reputation. That would change soon, she realised, and the thought made her angry in advance. She deliberately snubbed one of the Cape's most determined aspiring hostesses, publicly refusing her obsequious invitation and noting sardonically how the small cruelty increased the woman's respect. But all the time that she was playing these complicated social games, Sontaine was gazing over their heads, looking for blame. The liner's siren blared the final warning, and the ship's officers, resplendent in white tropical rig, passed amongst them with the polite instruction, This vessel is sailing in fifteen minutes. Will all those who are not passengers kindly go ashore immediately? Sontaine shook hands with Mr Davenport and joined the procession down the steep gangway to the dockside. There she lingered in the jovial press of visitors, staring up the liner's tall side and trying to pick out Isabella or her daughters from the passengers who lined the rail of the boat deck. Gaily coloured paper streamers fluttered in the southeaster as they were thrown down from the high decks and seized by eager hands on the quay side. Joining the vessel to land were the myriad frail umbilical cords. And suddenly, Sontaine recognised Blaine's eldest daughter. At this distance, Tara was looking very grown up and pretty in a dark dress and with her hair fashionably bobbed. Beside her, her sister had stuck her head through the railings and was furiously waving a pink handkerchief at someone on the dock below. Sontaine shaded her eyes and made out the figure in the wheelchair behind the two girls. Isabella was sitting with her face in shadow. And to Sontaine, she seemed suddenly to be the final harbinger of tragedy, an inimical force sent to plague her and deny her happiness. Oh, God, how I wished that she were easy to hate, she whispered. And her eyes followed the direction in which the two children were waving, and she began to edge her way through the crowd. Then she saw him. He had climbed up onto the carriage of one of the giant loading cranes. He was dressed in a cream-coloured tropical suit with his green and blue regimental tie and a wide-brimmed white Panama hat, which he had taken from his head and was waving at his daughters high above him. The southeaster had tumbled his dark hair onto his forehead and his teeth were very big and white against the dark mahogany of his tanned face. Sontaine withdrew into the crowd, from where she could watch him secretly. He is the one thing I will not lose. The thought gave her comfort. I will always have him, after Veltivraden and the Harney have been taken away. And then suddenly a hideous doubt assailed her. Is that truly so? She tried to close her mind to it, but the doubt slipped through. Does he love me, or does he love what I am? Will he still love me when I am just an ordinary woman, without wealth, without position, with nothing but another man's child? And the doubt filled her head with darkness and sickened her physically, so that when Blaine lifted his fingers to his lips and blew a kiss up towards the slim, pale, blanket-draped figure in the wheelchair, her jealousy struck again with gale force, and she stared at Blaine's face, torturing herself with his expression of affection and concern for his wife, feeling herself totally excluded and superfluous. Slowly the gap between the liner and the quay opened. The ship's band on the promenade deck struck up, God be with you, till we meet again. The bright paper streamers parted one by one and floated down, twisting and turning, falling like her ill-fated dreams and hopes 
to lie sodden and disintegrating in the murky waters of the harbour. The ship's sirens boomed farewell, and the steam tugs bustled in to take charge and work her out through the narrow entrance of the breakwater. Under her own steam, the huge white vessel gathered speed. A bow wave curled at her forefoot, and she turned majestically into the northwest to clear Robin Island. Around Sontaine, the crowds were drifting away, and within minutes she was alone on the dockside. Above her, Blaine still stood on the carriage of the crane, shading his eyes with the Panama hat, staring out across Table Bay for a last glimpse of the tall ship. There was no laughter now, no smile upon that wide mouth that she loved so dearly. He was supporting such a burden of sorrow that perforce she shared it with him, and it blended with her own doubts until the weight of it was unbearable, and she wanted to turn and run from it. Then suddenly he lowered the hat and turned and looked down at her. She felt guilty that she had spied upon him in this unguarded and private moment, and his own expression hardened into something that she could not fathom. Was it resentment or something worse? She never knew, for the moment passed. He jumped down from the carriage, landing lightly and gracefully for such a big man, and came slowly to where she waited in the shade of the crane, settling the hat back on his head, and shading his eyes with the brim, so that she could not be certain what they contained. And she was afraid, as she had never been before, as he stood before her. When can we be alone? he asked quietly. For I cannot wait another minute longer to be with you. All her fears, all her doubts, fell away and left her feeling bright and vibrant as a young girl again, almost light-headed with happiness. He loves me still, her heart sang. He will always love me. General James Barry Munich Herzog came out to Velteraden in a closed car which bore no mark or insignia of his high office. He was an old comrade-in-arms of Jan Christian Smuts. Both of them had fought with great distinction against the British during the South African War, and they had both taken a part in the peace negotiations at Vereeniging that ended that conflict. After that, they had served together on the National Convention that led to the Union of South Africa, and they had both been in the first cabinet of Louis Butha's government. Since then, their ways had diverged. Herzog taking the narrow view with his South Africa First doctrine, while Jan Smuts was the international statesman who had masterminded the formation of the British Commonwealth and had taken a leading part in the birth of the League of Nations. Herzog was militantly Afrikaner and secured for Afrikaans equal rights with English as an official language. His two streams policy opposed the absorption of his own bulk into a greater South Africa. And in 1931, he had forced Britain to recognise in the Statute of Westminster the equality of the dominions of the empire, including the right of secession from the Commonwealth. Tall and austere in appearance, he cut a formidable figure as he strode into the library of Welt of Raden, which Sontaine had placed indefinitely at their disposal and Jan Smuts rose from his seat at the long, green, baize-covered table and came to meet him. So, Herzog snorted as he shook hands, we may not have as much time for discussion and manoeuvre as we had hoped. General Smuts glanced down the table at Blaine Malcolmus and Dennis Reitz, his confidence and two of his nominees for the new cabinet. But none of them spoke while Herzog and Nicholas Habanga, the Nationalist Minister for Finance, settled themselves on the opposite side of the long table. At 17 years of age, Habanga had ridden with Herzog on commando against the British, acting as his secretary. And since then, 
they had been inseparable. Habenga had held his present cabinet rank since Herzog's nationalists had come to power in 1924. Are we safe here? he asked now, glancing suspiciously at the double brass-bound mahogany doors at the far end of the library, and then sweeping his gaze around the shelves, which rose to the ornately plastered ceiling, and were filled with Santaine's collection of books, all bound in Morocco leather and embossed with gold leaf. Quite safe, Smuts assured him. We may speak openly without the least fear of being overheard. I give you my personal assurance. Habenga looked at his master for further assurance, and when the Prime Minister nodded, he spoke with apparent reluctance. Thiel Manrouz has resigned from the Appellate Division, he announced, and sat back in his seat. It was unnecessary for him to elaborate. Thiel Manrouz was one of the country's best-known and most colourful characters. The Lion of the North was his nickname, and he had been one of Herzog's most royal supporters. When the Nationalists came to power, he had been Minister of Justice and Deputy Premier. It had seemed that he was destined to be Herzog's successor, the heir apparent. But then, failing health and disagreement over the issue of South Africa's adherence to the gold standard had intervened. He had retired from politics and accepted an appointment to the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court. Health? Jan Smets asked. No, the gold standard, Havanga said gravely. He intends coming out against our remaining upon the standard. His influence is enormous, Blaine exclaimed. We cannot let him throw doubt upon our policies, Herzog agreed. A declaration from Rus now could be disastrous. It must be our first priority to agree upon our joint policy on gold. We must be in a position either to oppose or preempt his position. It is vitally important that we offer a united front. He looked directly at Smuts. I agree, Smuts answered. We must not allow our new coalition to be discredited before we have even come into existence. This is a crisis, Havenga interjected. We must handle it as such. May we have your views, Ubas? You know my views, Smuts told them. You will recall that I urged you to follow Great Britain's example when she went off the gold standard. I don't wish to throw that in your faces now. But I haven't altered my views since then. Please go over your reasons again, Ubas, said Havenga. At the time, I predicted that there would be a flight from the South African gold pound into sterling. Bad money always drives out good money. And I was right. That happened. Smut stated simply. And the men opposite looked uncomfortable. The resulting loss of capital has crippled our industry and sent tens of thousands of our workers to swell the ranks of the unemployed. There are millions of unemployed in Britain herself, Havenga pointed out irritably. Our refusal to go off gold aggravated unemployment. It has endangered our gold mining industry. It has sent prices for our diamonds and wool crashing. It has deepened the depression to this tragic level where we now find ourselves. If we go off the gold standard at this late stage, where will be the benefits to the country? Asked Smuts. First, and by far the most important, it will rejuvenate our gold mining industry. If the South Africa pound falls to parity with sterling, and that is what should happen immediately, it will mean that the mines will receive seven pounds for an ounce of gold instead of the present four. Almost double. The mines that have closed down will reopen. The others will expand. New mines will open, providing work for tens of thousands, whites and blacks, and capital will flow back into this country. It will be the turning point. We will be back on the road to prosperity. The arguments for and against were thrown back and forth. 
Blaine and Wright supporting the old general, and gradually the two men opposite retreated before their logic until a little afternoon, Barry Herzog said suddenly, The timing. There will be pandemonium in the stock exchange. There are only three trading days before Christmas. We must delay any announcement until then. Do it only when the exchange is closed. The atmosphere in the library seemed palpable. With Herzog's statement, Blaine realised that Smuts had finally carried the argument. South Africa would be off gold before the stock exchange reopened in the new year. He felt a marvellous sense of elation, of achievement. The first act of this new coalition was to set a term to the country's protracted economic agony, a promise of return to prosperity and hope. I still have sufficient influence with Thielman to prevail upon him to d delay his announcement until after the markets close. Herzog was still speaking, but it was only the details that remained to be agreed upon. And that evening, as Blaine shook hands with the others in front of the white gables of Belt of Raiden and went to where his Ford was parked beneath the oaks, he was filled with a sense of destiny. It was this that had attracted him into the political arena this knowledge that he could help to change the world. For Blaine, this was the ultimate use of power, to wield it like a bright sword against the demons that plagued his people and his land. I have become a part of history, he thought, and the elation stayed with them as he drove out through the magnificent Anreath gates of Velteraden, the last in the small convoy of vehicles. Deliberately, he let the Prime Minister's car, followed by the Plymouth that Denny's Wrights was driving, pull even further ahead and then disappear into the bends that snaked up Weinberg Hill. Only then he pulled off onto the verge and sat for a few minutes with the engine idling, watching the rear-view mirror to make certain that he was not observed. Then he put the Ford in gear again, and swung a U-turn across the road. He turned off the main road, before he reached the Anreath gates, into a lane that skirted the boundary of Velteraden. And within minutes, he was once more on Sontaine's land, coming in through one of the back lanes, hidden from the chateau and the main buildings, by a plantation of pines. He parked the ford amongst the trees, and set off along the path, breaking into a run, as he saw the whitewashed walls of the cottage ahead of him gleaming in the golden rays of the setting sun. It was exactly as she had described to him. He paused in the doorway. Sontaine had not heard him. She was kneeling before the open hearth, blowing on the smoky flames that were rising from the pile of pine cones she had set as kindling for the fire. For a while, he watched her from the doorway, delighted to be able to observe her while she was still unaware of him. She had removed her shoes, and the soles of her bare feet were pink and smooth, her ankles slim, her calves firm and strong from riding and walking, the backs of her knees dimpled. He had never noticed that before, and the dimples touched him. He was moved by the deep tenderness that until now he had felt only for his own daughters, and he made a small sound in his throat. Santaine turned, springing to her feet the instant she saw him. I thought you weren't coming. She rushed to him, holding up her face to him, her eyes shining, and then, after a long time, she broke off the kiss, and still in his arms studied his face. You are tired, she said. It has been a long day. Come. Holding his hand, she led him to the chair beside the hearth. Before he sat, she slipped the jacket off his shoulders and stood on tiptoe to loosen his necktie. I have always wanted to do that for you, she murmured, and hung his jacket in the small yellow wood cupboard before she went into the centre table and poured whisky into a tumbler, squirted soda onto it from the siphon, and brought it to him. Is that right? she asked anxiously, and he sipped and nodded. Perfect. 
He looked around the cottage, taking in the bunches of cut flowers in the vases, the gleam of new wax on the floors, and simple, solid furniture. Very nice, he said. I worked all day to have it ready for you. Sontaine looked up from the cheroot that she was preparing. Anna used to live here until she married Sir Gary. Nobody else has used it since then. Nobody comes here. It's our place now, Blaine. She brought the cheroot to him, lit a taper in the fire, and held it for him until it was burning evenly. Then she placed one of the leather cushions at his feet and settled upon it, leaning her folded arms on his knee and watching his face in the light of the flames. How long can you stay? Well, he looked thoughtful. How long do you want me? An hour? Two? Longer? And Sontaine squirmed with pleasure and clasped his knees tightly. The whole night, she gloated. The whole glorious night. She had brought down a basket from the kitchen at Belt of Raiden. They dined on cold roast beef and turkey and drank the wines from her own vineyards. Afterwards, she peeled the big yellow hand poured grapes and popped them into his mouth one at a time, kissing his lips lightly between each morsel. The grapes are sweet, he smiled, but I prefer the kisses. Fortunately, sir, there is no shortage of either, she said. Sontaine brewed coffee on the open hearth, and they drank it sprawled together on the rug in front of the fire, watching the flames, neither of them speaking. But Blaine stroked the fine, dark hairs at her temples and at the nape of her neck with his fingers, until slowly the tranquil mood hardened and he ran his fingers down her spine, and she trembled and rose to her feet. "'Where are you going?' he demanded. Finish your cheroot, she told him, then come and find out. When he followed her into the small bedroom, she was sitting in the centre of the low bed. He had never seen her in a nightdress before. It was a pale lemon satin, and the lace at the neck and cuffs was the colour of old ivory that glowed in the candlelight. You are beautiful, he said. You make me feel beautiful, she said gravely, and held out both hands to him. Tonight they're loving, in contrast to the other urgent, wildly driven nights, was measured and slow, almost stately. She had not realised that he had learned so much about her body and its special needs. Calmly and skilfully, he ministered to them, and her trust in him was complete. Gently he swept away her last reservations and bore her beyond the sense of self, his body deep in hers and she enfolding him and blending with him, so that their very blood seemed to mingle and his pulse beat in time to her heart. It was his breath that filled her lungs, his thoughts that gleamed and glimmered through her brain, and she heard her own words echo in his eardrums. I love you, my darling. Oh, God, how I love you. And his voice replied, crying through the cavern of her own throat, his voice upon her lips, I love you. I love you. And they were one. He woke before her, and the sunbirds were twittering in the bright orange-coloured blooms of the Tacoma shrubs outside the cottage window. A beam of sunlight had found a chink in the curtains, and it cut through the air above his head like the blade of a golden rapier. Slowly, very slowly, so as not to disturb her, he turned his head and studied her face. She had thrown aside her pillow, and her cheek was pressed to the mattress, her lips almost touching his shoulder, one arm thrown out over his chest. Her eyes were closed, and there was a delicate pattern of blue veins beneath the soft, translucent skin of the lids. Her breathing was so gentle that for a moment he was alarmed. Then she frowned softly in her sleep, 
and his alarm gave way to concern as he saw the tiny arrowheads of strain and worry that had been chiselled at the corners of her eyes and mouth during these last months. My poor darling. His lips formed the words without sound, and slowly the splendid mood of the previous night washed away like sand before the incoming tide of harsh reality. My poor, brave darling. He had not known grief like this since he stood beside his father's open grave. If only there was something I could do to help you, now, in this time of your need. And as he said it, the thought occurred to him, and he started so violently that Santaine felt it and rolled away from him in her sleep, frowning again, the corner of her eyelid twitching, and she muttered something that he could not understand and then was still. Blaine lay rigid beside her, every muscle in his body under stress, his fists clenched at his sides, his jaws biting down hard, appalled at himself, angry and frightened that he had been even capable of thinking that thought. His eyes were wide open now. He stared at the bright coin of sunlight on the opposite wall, but did not see it. For he was a man on the torturer's rack, the rack of a terrible temptation. Honour. The words blazed in his mind. Honour and duty. He groaned silently, as on the other side of his brain, another word burned as fiercely. Love. The woman who lay beside him had set no price upon her love. She had made no terms, no bargains, but had simply given without asking in return. Rather than demanding, she had given him quittance. It was she who had insisted that no other person should be hurt by their happiness. Freely, she had heaped upon him all the sweets of her love without asking the smallest price. Not the gold band and vows of marriage, not even promises or assurances, and he had offered nothing. Until this moment, there had been nothing for him to give her in repayment. On the other hand, he had been singled out by a great and good man who had placed unquestioning trust in him. Honour and duty on one hand, love on the other. This time there was no escape from the lash of his conscience. Who would he betray, the man he revered or the woman he loved? He could not lie still another moment, and stealthily he lifted the sheet. Santaine's eyelids fluttered. She made a little mewling sound and then settled deeper into sleep. The previous evening she had laid out a new razor and toothbrush on the washstand in the bathroom for him, and this little thoughtfulness goaded him further. The agony of indecision scourged him as he shaved and dressed. He tiptoed back into the bedroom and stood beside the bed. I could walk away, he thought. She will never know of my treachery. And then he wondered at his choice of word. Was it treachery to keep intact his honour, to cleave to his duty? He forced the thought aside and made his decision. He reached down and touched her eyelids. They fluttered open. She looked up at him, her pupils very black and big and unfocused. Then they contracted and she smiled. A comfortable, sleepy, contented smile. Darling, she murmured, what time is it? Santaine, are you awake? She sat up quickly and exclaimed with dismay, Oh, Blaine! You are dressed so soon. Listen to me, Santaine. This is very important. Are you listening? She nodded, blinking the last vestiges of sleep from her eyes, and stared at him solemnly. Santaine, we are going off gold, he said, and his voice was harsh, rough with self-contempt and guilt. 
They made the decision yesterday, Ubas and Barry Herzog. We'll be off gold by the time the markets reopen in the new year. She stared at him blankly for a full five seconds, and then suddenly it struck her, and her eyes flared wide open, but then slowly the fire in them faded again. Oh, my God, my darling, what must it have cost you to tell me that, she said. And her voice shook with compassion, for she understood his sense of honour and knew the depths of his duty. You do love me, Blaine. You do truly love me. I believe it now. Yet he was glaring at her. She had never seen such an expression on his face before. It was almost as though he hated her for what he had done. She couldn't bear that look, and she scrambled under her knees in the centre of the rumpled bed and held out her arms in appeal. Blaine, I won't use it. I won't use what you have told me. And he snarled at her, his face contorted with guilt. That way you would let me make this sacrifice for naught. Don't hate me for it, Blaine, she pleaded, and the anger faded from his face. Hate you? he asked sadly. No, Santaine, that I could never do. She wanted to run after him, to try and comfort him, but she knew that it was beyond even the power of her great love. She sensed that, like a wounded lion, he had to be alone and she listened to his heavy footfalls receding down the path through the plantation outside her window. Sontaine sat at her desk at Veltevreden. She was alone, and in the centre of her desk stood the ivory and brass telephone. She was afraid. What she was about to do would place her far beyond the laws of society and the courts. She was at the beginning of a journey into uncharted territory, a lonely, dangerous journey, which could end for her in disgrace and imprisonment. The telephone rang, and she started, and stared at the instrument fearfully. It rang again, and she drew a deep breath and lifted the handset. Your call to Rabkin and Swales, Mrs. Courtney, her secretary told her. I have Mr. Swales on the line. Thank you, Nigel. She heard the hollow tone of her voice and cleared her throat. Mrs. Courtney, she recognised Swales' voice. He was the senior partner in the firm of stockbrokers, and she had dealt with him before. May I wish you the compliments of the festive season, he said. Thank you, Mr. Swales. Her voice was crisp and businesslike. I have a buying order for you, Mr. Swales. I'd like it filled before the market closes today. Of course, Swales assured her. We will complete it immediately. Please buy, at best, 500,000 East Rand proprietary mines, she said. And there was an echoing silence in the earphones. Five hundred thousand, Mrs. Courtney, Swales repeated at last. ERPM are standing at twenty-two and six. That is almost six hundred thousand pounds. Exactly, Santaine agreed. Uh, Mrs. Courtney, Swales stopped. Is there some problem, Mr. Swales? Uh, no, no, of course not. N none at all. You caught me by surprise, that's all. Uh, just the size of the order. I will get on to it right away. I will post you my cheque in full settlement just as soon as I receive your contract note for the purchase. She paused, and then went on icily. Unless, of course, you require me to send you a deposit immediately. She held her breath. Nowhere could she raise even the deposit that Swales was entitled to ask for. Oh, dear Mrs. Courtney, I hope you didn't think... 
I must sincerely apologise for having led you to think that I might question your ability to pay. There is absolutely no hurry. We will post you the contract note in the usual way. Your credit with Rapkin and Swales is always good. I hope to confirm the purchase for you by tomorrow morning at the very latest. As you are no doubt aware, tomorrow is the final trading day before the Christmas recess. Her hands were shaking so violently that she had trouble setting the handset of the telephone on its hook. What have I done? she whispered. And she knew the answer. She had committed a criminal act of fraud, the maximum penalty for which was ten years imprisonment. She had just contracted a debt which she had no reasonable expectation of honouring. She was bankrupt, she knew she was bankrupt, and she had just taken on another half million pounds obligation. She was taken with a fit of remorse, and she reached for the telephone to cancel the order, but it rang before she touched it. Mrs. Courtney, I have Mr. Anderson of Hawks and Giles on the line. Put him on, please, Nigel, she ordered. And she was amazed that there was no tremor in her voice, as she said casually. Mr. Anderson, I have a purchase order for you, please. By noon, she had telephoned seven separate firms of stockbrokers in Johannesburg and placed orders for the purchase of gold mining shares to the value of five and a half million pounds. Then at last her nerve failed her. Nigel, cancel the other two calls, please, she said calmly and ran to her private bathroom at the end of the passage with her hands over her mouth. Just in time, she fell to her knees in front of the white porcelain toilet bowl and vomited into it a hard projectile stream, bringing up her terror and shame and guilt, heaving and retching until her stomach was empty and the muscles of her chest ached and her throat burned as though it had been scalded raw with acid. Christmas Day had always been one of their very special days since Shasa was a child, but she awoke this morning in a sombre mood. Still in their night clothes and dressing gowns, she and Shasa exchanged their presents in her suite. He had hand-painted a special card for her and decorated it with pressed wild flowers. His present to her was François Mauriac's new novel, Noir de Vipère, and he had inscribed on the flyleaf, No matter what, we still have each other. Shasa. Her present to him was a leather flying helmet with goggles, and he looked at her with amazement. She had made her opposition to flying very plain. Yes, Cherie, if you want to learn to fly, I'll not stop you. Can we afford it, Mater? I mean, you know... You let me worry about that, she said. No, Mater. He shook his head firmly. I'm not a child any more. From now on, I'm going to help you. I don't want anything that will make it more difficult for you. For us. She ran to him and embraced him quickly, pressing her cheek to his so that he could not see the shine of tears in her eyes. We are desert creatures. We will survive, my darling. But her moods swung wildly all the rest of that day, as Sontaine played the Grande Dame, the Chatelaine of Veltevreden, welcoming the many callers at the estate serving sherry and biscuits and exchanging gifts with them, laughing and charming, and then, on the pretext of seeing to the servants, hurrying away to lock herself in the mirrored study with the drawn curtains, while she fought off the black moods, the doubts and the terrible crippling forebodings. Shasta seemed to understand, standing in her place when she fell out, suddenly mature and responsible, rallying to her aid, as he had never been called upon to do before. 
Just before noon, one of their callers brought tidings which genuinely allowed Santaine to forget, for a short time, her own forebodings. The Reverend Canon Burt was the headmaster of bishops, and he took Santaine and Chassa aside for a few moments. Mrs. Courtney, you know what a name young Chassa has made for himself at bishops. Unfortunately, next year will be his last with us. We shall miss him. However, I am sure it will come as no surprise to you to hear that I have selected him to be head of school in the new term, or that the Board of Governors has endorsed my choice. Not in front of the head, Mater, Chassa whispered in an agony of embarrassment when Santaine embraced him joyously. But she deliberately kissed both his cheeks in the manner he designated French, and pretend to disparage. That is not all, Mrs. Courtney. Canon Burt beamed on this display of maternal pride. I have been asked by the Board of Governors to invite you to join them. You will be the first woman, um, the first lady, ever to sit on the board. Sontaine was on the point of accepting immediately, but then, like the shadow of the executioner's axe, the premonition of impending financial catastrophe dulled her vision, and she hesitated. I know you are a very busy person, he was about to urge her. I am honoured, headmaster, she told him, but there are personal considerations. May I give you my reply in the new year? Well, just as long as that is not an outright refusal. No, I give you my assurance. If I can, I will. When the last caller had been packed off, Santaine could lead the family, including Sir Gary and Anna and the very closest family friends, down to the polo field for the next act in their traditional Belt of Raiden Christmas festival. The entire coloured staff was assembled there with their children and aged parents and the estate pensioners too old to work, and all the others who Santaine supported. Every one of them was dressed in their Sunday best, a marvellous assortment of styles and cuts and colours, the little girls with ribbons in their hair and the small boys for once with shoes on their feet. The estate band, fiddles and concertinas and banjos, welcomed Santaine, and the singing, the very voice of Africa, was melodious and beautiful. She had a gift for each of them, which she handed over with an envelope containing their Christmas bonus. Some of the older women, emboldened by their long service and sense of occasion, embraced her. And so precarious was Santaine's mood that these spontaneous gestures of affection made her weep again, which set the other women off. It was swiftly becoming an orgy of sentiment, and Chassa hastily signalled the band to strike up something lively. They chose Alabama, the old Cape Malay song that commemorated the cruise of the Confederate raider to Cape Waters when she captured the Sea Bride in Table Bay on the 5th of August, 1863. There comes the Alabama. Dar com de Alabama. Then Chassa supervised the drawing of the bung from the first keg of sweet estate wine, and almost immediately the tears dried and the mood became festive and gay. Once the whole sheep on the spits were sizzling and dripping rich fat onto the coals, the second keg of wine had been broached. The dancing was losing all restraint, and the younger couples were sneaking away into the vineyards, and then Santaine gathered the party from the big house and left them to it. As they passed the Huguenot vineyard, they heard the giggling and scuffling amongst the vines behind the stone wall, and Sir Gary remarked complacently, "'Shouldn't think Belt of Raiden is going to run short of labour in the foreseeable future. Sounds like a good crop being planted.' "'You are as shameless as they are,' Anna huffed, and then giggled herself, just as breathlessly as the young girls in the vineyard. 
as he squeezed her thick waist and whispered something into her ear. That little intimacy lanced Santaine with a blade of loneliness, and she thought of Blaine and wanted to weep again. But Chasseur seemed to sense her pain and took her hand and made her laugh with one of his silly jokes. The family dinner was part of the tradition. Before they ate, Chasseur read aloud to them from the New Testament, as he had every Christmas day since his sixth birthday. Then he and Santaine distributed the pile of presents from under the tree, and the salon was filled with a rustle of paper and the oohs and ahs of delight. The dinner was roast turkeys and a baron of beef, followed by a rich black Christmas pudding. Chasseur found the lucky gold sovereign in his portion, as he did every year without suspecting that it had been carefully salted there by Santaine during the serving. And when at the end they all tottered away, satiated and heavy-eyed, to their separate bedrooms, Santaine slipped out of the French windows of her study and ran all the way down through the plantation and burst into the cottage. Blaine was waiting for her, and she ran to him. We should be together at Christmas and every other day, she said. He stopped her from going on by kissing her, and she reviled herself for her silliness. When she pulled back in his arms, she was smiling brightly. I couldn't wrap your Christmas present. The shape is all wrong, and the ribbon wouldn't stay on. You'll have to take it au naturel. Where is it? he asked. Follow me, sir, and it shall be delivered unto you. Now that, he said a little later, is by far the nicest present that anybody ever gave me, and so very useful, too. There were no newspapers on New Year's Day, but Santaine listened to the news every hour on the radio. There was no mention of the gold standard, or any other political issue on these bulletins. Blaine was away, occupied all day with meetings and discussions concerning his candidature for the coming parliamentary by-election at the gardens. Chasseur had gone as house guest to one of the neighbouring estates. She was alone with her fears and doubts. She read until after midnight, and then lay in the darkness, sleeping only fitfully, and plagued by nightmares, starting awake and then drifting back into uneasy sleep. Long before dawn she gave up the attempt to find rest, and dressed in yodpers and riding boots and her sheepskin coat. She saddled her favourite stallion and rode down in the darkness five miles to the railway station at Claremont to meet the early train from Cape Town. She was waiting on the platform when the bundles of newspapers were thrown out of the goods van onto the concrete quay, and the small, coloured newsboys swarmed over them, chattering and laughing as they divided up the bundles for delivery. Santaine tossed one of them a silver shilling, and he hooted with glee when she waved away the change and eagerly unfolded the newspaper. The headlines took up fully half the front page, and they rocked her on her feet. South Africa abandons gold standard. Huge boost for gold mines. She scanned the columns below, barely able to take in any more, and then, still in a daze, rode back up the valley to Veltevreden. Only when she reached the Enreath gates did the full impact of it all dawn upon her. Veltevreden was still hers. It would always be hers. And she rose in the stirrups and shouted with joy, then urged her horse into a flying gallop, lifting him over the stone wall and racing down between the rows of vines. She left him in his stall and ran all the way back to the chateau. She had to talk to someone if only it could have been Blaine. But Sir Gary was in the dining room. He was always first down for breakfast. Have you heard the news, my dear? He cried excitedly the moment she entered. 
I heard it on the radio at six o'clock. We are off gold. Herzog did it. By God, there will be a few fortunes made and lost this day. Anybody who is holding gold shares will double and treble their money. Oh, my dear, is something wrong? Santaine had collapsed into her chair at the head of the dining room table. No, no. She shook her head frantically. There is nothing wrong. Not any more. Everything is all right. Wonderfully, magnificently, stupendously all right. At lunchtime, Blaine telephoned her at Belt of Raiden. He had never done so before. His voice sounded hollow and strange on the scratchy line. He did not announce himself, but said simply, Five o'clock at the cottage. Yes, I'll be there. She wanted to say more, but the line clicked dead. She went down to the cottage an hour early, with fresh flowers, clean, crispy iron linen for the bed, and a bottle of Bollinger champagne, and she was waiting for him when he walked into the living room. There are no words that can adequately express my gratitude, she said. That is the way I want it, Sontaine, he told her seriously. No words. We will never talk about it again. I shall try to convince myself it never happened. Please promise me never to mention it. Never again as long as we live and love each other. I give you my solemn word, she said. And then all her relief and joy came bubbling up and she kissed him, laughing. Won't you open the champagne? And she raised the brimming glass when he handed it to her and gave him his own words back as a toast. For as long as we live and love each other, my darling. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange reopened on January the 2nd, and in the first hour very little business could be conducted, for the floor was like a battlefield, as the brokers literally tore at each other, screaming for attention. But by call-over the market had shaken itself out and settled at its new levels. Swales, of Rabkin and Swales, was the first of her brokers to telephone Santaine. Like the market, his tone was buoyant and evanescent. My dear Mrs. Courtney, in the circumstances Santaine was prepared to let that familiarity pass. My very dear Mrs. Courtney, your timing has been almost miraculous. As you know, we were unfortunately unable to fill your entire purchase order. We were able to obtain only 440,000 ERPMs at an average price of 25 shillings. The volume of your order pushed the price up two and six. However, she could almost hear him puffing himself up to make his announcement. However, I am delighted to be able to tell you that this morning ERPMs are trading at 55 shillings and still rising. I am looking forward to 60 shillings by the end of the week. 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 Sell them, Santaine said quietly, and heard him choke at the end of the line. If I may be permitted to offer a word of advice, sell them, she repeated, sell all of them. And she hung up, staring out of the window as she tried to calculate her profits. But the telephone rang again before she reached a total, and one after another her brokers triumphantly reported on the contracts she had made. Then there was a call from Windhoek. Dr. Twentyman-Jones, it's so good to hear your voice. She had recognised him instantly. Well, Mrs. Courtney, this is a pretty pickle, Twentyman-Jones told her glumly. The Harney mine will be back in profit again now, even with the parsimonious quota de Beers is allowing us. We've turned the corner, Santaine enthused. We are out of the woods. Many a slip twixt cup and lip, gloomily Twentyman Jones capped cliché with cliché. Best not to count our chickens, Mrs. Courtney. 
Dr. Twentyman Jones, I love you, Sontaine laughed delightedly, and there was a shot silence that echoed across a thousand miles of wire. I'll be there just as soon as I can get away from here. There is a lot for us to work on now. She hung up and went to look for Chasser. He was down at the stables, chatting with his coloured grooms, as they sat in the sun, dubbing his polo harness and saddlery. Cherie, I'm driving into Cape Town. Will you come with me? What are you going all that way for, Mater? he asked. It's a surprise. That was the one certain way to gain Chasser's full attention, and he tossed the harness he was working on to Abel and sprang to his feet. Her ebullient mood was infectious, and they were laughing together as they walked into Porter's Motors showroom on Strand Street. The sales manager came from his cubicle on the run. Mrs. Courtney, we haven't seen you in far too long. May I wish you a happy and prosperous new year. It's off to a good start on both counts, she smiled. And speaking of happiness, Mr. Timms, how soon can you deliver my new Daimler? It will be yellow, naturally. With black piping, naturally. And the usual fittings, he queried, the vanity, the cocktail cabinet. All of them, Mr. Timms. I will cable our London office immediately. Shall we say four months, Mrs. Courtney? Let us rather say three months, Mr. Timms. Chasser could barely contain himself until they were on the pavements in front of the showroom. Mater, have you gone bonkers? We are paupers. Well, Cherie, let's be paupers with a little class and style. Where are we going now? The post office, she said. And at the telegraph counter, Santen drafted a cable to Sotheby's in Bond Street, which read, Sale no longer contemplated. Stop. Please cancel all preparations. Then they went to lunch at the Mount Nelson Hotel. Blaine had promised to meet her as early as he was able to escape from the meeting of the proposed new coalition cabinet. He was as good as his word, waiting for her in the pine forest, and when she saw his face, her happiness shriveled. What is it, Blaine? Let's walk, Santaine. I've been indoors all day. They climbed the Karbenkelberg slopes behind the estate. At the summit, they sat on a fallen log to watch the sunset, and it was magnificent. This was the fairest cape which we discovered in all our circumnavigation of the earth, she misquoted from Vasco da Gama's log. But Blaine did not correct her, as she had hoped he might. Tell me, Blaine. She took his arm and insisted, and he turned his face to her. Isabella, he said somberly. You have heard from her? Her spirit sank deeper at the name. The doctors can do nothing for her. She will be returning on the next mail ship from Southampton. In the silence, the sun sank into the silver sea, taking the light from the world, and Santaine's soul was as dark. How ironic it is, she whispered. Because of you, I can have anything in this world except that which I most desire. You, my love. The women pounded the fresh millet grain in the wooden mortars into a coarse, fluffy white meal and filled one of the leather sacks. Carrying the sack, Svart Hendrik, followed by Moses, his brother, left the kraal after the rise of the new moon and crept silently up the ridge in the night. While Hendrik stood guard, Moses climbed to the old eagle owl nest in the leadwood tree and brought down the cartridge paper packets. They moved along the ridge, 
until they were beyond all possible chance of observation from the village. And even then, they very carefully screened the small fire that they built amongst the ironstone boulders. Hendrik broke open the packets and poured the gleaming stones into a small calabash gourd, while Moses prepared the millet meal in another gourd, mixing it with water until it was a soft porridge. Meticulously, Hendrik burned the cartridge paper wrappings in the fire and stirred the ashes to powder with a stick. When it was done, he nodded at his younger brother and Moses poured the dough over the coals. As it began to bubble, Hendrik buried the diamonds in the unleavened dough. Moses muttered ruefully as the millet cakes bubbled and hardened. It was almost an incantation. These are death stones. We will have no joy of them. The white men love them too dearly. They are the stones of death and madness. Hendrik ignored him and, shaking the baking loaves, squinting his eyes against the smoke and smiling secretly to himself. When each round loaf was crisp brown on the underside, he flipped it over and let it cook through until it was brick hard. Then he lifted it off the fire and set it out to cool. Finally, he repacked the crude, thick loaves into the leather sack and they returned quietly to the sleeping village. In the morning they left early, and the women went with them the first mile of the journey, ululating mournfully and singing the song of farewell. When they fell behind, neither of the men looked back. They trudged on towards the low brown horizon, carrying their bundles balanced on their heads. They did not think about it, but this little scene was acted out every single day in a thousand villages across the southern subcontinent. Days later, the two men, still on foot, reached the recruitment station. It was a single-roomed general dealer's store, standing alone at a remote crossroad on the edge of the desert. The white trader augmented his precarious business by buying cattle hides from the surrounding nomadic tribes and by recruiting for Venella. Venella was the acronym for the Witwatersrand Native Labour Association, a ubiquitous, sprawling enterprise which extended its tentacles into the vastness of the African wilderness. From the peaks of the Dragon Mountains in Basuto land to the swamps of the Zambezi and Chobe, from the thirst lands of the Kalahari to the rainforest of the high plateau of Nyasaland, it gathered up the trickle of black men and channeled them first into a stream and finally into a mighty river that ran endlessly to the fabulous gold fields of the Ridge of White Waters, the Witwatersrand of Transvaal. The trader looked over these two new recruits in a perfunctory manner, as they stood dumbly before him. Their faces were deliberately expressionless, their eyes blank, the only perfect defence of the black African in the presence of the white man. Name? the trader demanded. Henry Tabaka. Henrik had chosen his new name to cover his relationship to Moses and to throw off any chance connection with Luther de la Rey and the robbery. Name, the trader looked at Moses. Moses Gama. He pronounced it with a guttural G. Have you worked on the mines before? Do you speak English? Yes, Bazi. They were obsequious, and the trader grinned. Good, very good. You will be rich men when you come home from Goldie. Plenty of wives? Plenty of jig-jig, hey? He grinned lavishly as he issued them each with a green vanilla card and a bus ticket. The bus will come soon. Wait outside, he ordered, and promptly lost all interest in them. He had earned his guinea-a-head recruitment fee, good money easily made, and his obligation to the recruits was at an end. 
They waited under the scraggy thorn tree at the side of the iron-roofed trading store for forty-eight hours before the railway's bus came rattling and banging and blowing blue smoke across the dreary wastes. It stopped briefly, and they slung their meagre luggage up onto the roof rack that was already piled with calabashes and boxes and bundles, with trussed goats and cages of woven bark stuffed with live fowls. Then they climbed into the overloaded coach and squeezed onto one of the hard wooden benches. The bus bellowed and blustered on over the plains, and the rows of black passengers, wedged shoulder to shoulder, jolted and swayed in unison as it pitched and rolled over the rutted tracks. Two days later, the bus stopped outside the barbed wire gates of the vanilla staging post on the outskirts of Windhoek, and most of the passengers, all young men, descended and stood looking about them aimlessly, until a huge black overseer, with brass plaques of authority on his arm and a long jambok in his hand, chivered them into line and led them through the gates. The white station manager sat on the stoop of his office building. His boots propped on the half wall of the stoop and a black bottle of German lager at his elbow, fanning himself with his hat. One at a time, the black boss boy pushed the new recruits in front of him for appraisal. He rejected only one, a skinny little runt of a man who barely had the strength to shuffle up to the veranda. That bastard is riddled with TB. The manager took a gulp of his lager. Get rid of him. Send him back where he came from. When Hendrick stepped forward, he straightened up in his thonged chair and set down the lager glass. What is your name, boy? he asked. Tabaka. Ha! You speak English. The manager's eyes narrowed. He could pick out the troublemakers. That was his job. He could tell by their eyes the gleam of intelligence and aggression in them. He could tell by the way they walked and carried their shoulders. This big, strutting, sullen black was big trouble. You in trouble with the police, boy? he asked again. You steal other man's cattle? You kill your brother, perhaps? Or jig-jig his wife, hey? Hendrick stared at him flatly. Answer me, boy. No. You call me Bass when you speak to me, do you understand? Yes, Bass, Hendrick said carefully. And the manager opened the police file that lay on the table beside him and thumbed through it slowly. Suddenly looking up, to catch any sign of guilt or apprehension on Hendrick's face. But he was wearing the African mask again, dumb and resigned and inscrutable. Christ, they stink! He threw the file back onto the table again. Take them away, he told the black boss boy, and he picked up his beer bottle and glass and went back into his office. You know better than that, my brother, Moses whispered to him as they were marched away towards the line of thatched huts. When you meet a hungry white hyena, you do not put your hand in his mouth. And Hendrik did not reply. They were fortunate. The draft was almost full. Three hundred black men already gathered in and waiting in the line of huts behind the barbed wire fence. Some of them had been there ten days, and it was time for the next stage of their journey. Thus, Hendrik and Moses were not forced to endure another interminable wait. That night, three railway coaches were shunted onto the spur of line that ran beside the camp, and the boss boys roused them before dawn. "'Gather your belongings! Sheili, the hour has struck! The steamer waits to take you to Goldie, to the place of gold!' They formed up in their ranks again and answered to the roll call. Then they were marched to the waiting coaches. Here there was another white man in charge. 
He was tall and sun-browned. His khaki shirt sleeves rolled up high on his sinewy biceps and wisps of blonde hair hanging from under the shapeless black hat that was pulled low down on his forehead. His features were flat and slavic. His teeth crocked and stained with tobacco smoke and his eyes were light misty blue. He smiled perpetually in a bland idiotic fashion and sucked at a cavity in one of his back teeth. He carried a jambok on a thong from his wrist, and now and then, for no apparent reason, he flicked the tapered end of the hippohide whip against the bare legs of one of the men filing past him. It was a casual act, born of disinterest and disdain, rather than calculated cruelty. And though each stroke was feathery light, it stung like a hornet, and the victim gasped and skipped and shot up the ladder into the coach with alacrity. Hendrick drew level with him, and the foreman's lips drew back from his bad teeth as he smiled even more widely. The camp manager had pointed out the big Ovambo to him. A bad one, he had warned him. Watch him. Don't let him get out of hand. And now he used his wrist in the stroke that he aimed at the tender skin at the back of Hendrick's knee. Chicha! the overseer ordered, hurry up! And the lash popped as it wrapped around Hendrick's leg. It did not split the skin. The overseer was an expert. But it left a purple-black welt on the dark, velvety skin. Hendrick stopped dead. The other leg lifted to the first rung of the boarding ladder, gripping the rail with his free hand, with the other hand balancing his bundle on his shoulder and he turned his head slowly until he was staring into the overseer's pale blue eyes. Yes, the overseer encouraged him softly, and for the first time there was a sparkle of interest in his eyes. He altered his stance subtly, coming onto the balls of his feet. Yes, he repeated, he wanted to take this big black bastard here in front of all the others. There were going to be five days in these coaches, five hot, thirsty days, during which tempers and nerves would be rubbed raw. He always liked to do it right at the beginning of the journey. It only needed one, and it would save a lot of trouble later if he made an example right here on the siding. That way all of them would know what to expect if they started anything. And in his experience, they never did start anything after that. Come on, Kaffer. He dropped his voice even lower, making the insult more personal and intense. He enjoyed this part of his work, and he was very good at it. This cocky bastard would not be fit to travel when he had finished with him. He wouldn't be much use to anybody, with four or five ribs stoved in, and perhaps a broken jaw. Hendrick was too quick for him. He went up the ladder into the coach in a single bound, leaving the overseer on the siding, braced and poised for his attack, with the jambok held overhand, ready to drive the point of the butt, into Hendrick's throat as he charged. Hendrick's move took him completely off balance, so that when he aimed a hard cut of the lash at Hendrick's legs as he went up the ladder, he was too late by a full half-second, and the stroke hissed and died in air. Following behind his brother, Moses saw the murderous expression on the white overseer's face as he passed. It is not yet ended, he warned Hendrick, as they placed their bundles on the overhead racks and settled on the hard wooden bench that ran the length of the coach. He will come after you again. In the middle of the morning, the three coaches were pulled off the spur and coupled to the rear of a long train of goods carriages. 
and after another few hours of shunting and jolting and false starts, they rumbled slowly up the hills and then ran southwards. Late in the afternoon, the train stopped for half an hour at a small siding, and a food barrow was loaded into the leading coach. Under the pale eyes of the white overseer, the two black boss boys wheeled the barrow down the crowded coaches, and each of the recruits was handed a small tin dish of white maize cake, over which a dollop of bean stew had been spooned. When they reached Sfort Hendrick's seat, the white overseer shouldered the boss boy aside and took the dish from his hands to serve Hendrick's portion himself. We must look after this kaffir, he said loudly. We want him to be strong for his work at Goldie. And he spooned an extra portion of bean stew into the dish and offered it to Hendrick. Here, kaffir! But as Hendrick reached for the dish, he deliberately let it drop onto the floor. The hot stew splashed over Hendrick's feet, and the overseer stepped into the mess of maize porridge and ground it under his boot. Then he stood back with one hand on the billy club in his belt and grinned. Hey, you clumsy black bugger! You only get one ration. If you want to eat it off the floor, that's up to you. He waited expectantly for Hendrick to react, and then grimaced with disappointment when Hendrick dropped his eyes, leaned forward, and began to scrape the mashed cake into the dish with his fingers, then scooped a ball of it into his mouth and munched on it stolidly. "'You bloody niggers will eat anything, even your own dung,' he snarled and went on down the coach. The windows of the coaches were barred, and the doors at both ends were locked and bolted from the outside. The overseer carried the ring of keys on his belt, carefully securing all doors behind him as he passed. From experience he knew that many of the recruits would begin to have misgivings as soon as the journey began, and driven by homesickness and increasing fear of the unknown, by the disturbing unfamiliarity of all about them, would begin to desert, some of them even leaping from the speeding coach. The overseer made his rounds every few hours, meticulously counting heads, even in the middle of the night. And he stood over Hendrick deliberately, shining the beam of his lantern into his face, waking him every time he passed down the coach. The overseer never tired of his efforts to provoke Hendrick. It had become a challenge, a contest between them. He knew it was there. He had seen it in Hendrick's eyes, just a flash of the violence and menace and power, and he was determined to bring it out, flush it into the open where he could crush it and destroy it. Patience, my brother, Moses whispered to Hendrick. Hold your anger. Cherish it with care. Let it grow until it is full term, until you can put it to work for you. Hendrick was coming to rely more on his brother's advice and counsel with each day that passed. Moses was intelligent and persuasive, his tongue quick to choose the right word, and that special presence which he possessed made other men listen when he spoke. Hendrick saw these special gifts of his demonstrated clearly in the days that followed. At first, he spoke only to the men that sat near him in the hot, crowded coach. He told them what it would be like at the place where they were going, and how the white men would treat them, what would be expected of them, and what the consequences would be if they disappointed their new employers. The black faces around him were intent as they listened, and soon those further up the benches were craning to catch his words and calling softly, Speak louder, Gamma. Speak, that all of us may hear your words. Moses Gamma raised his voice, a clear, compelling baritone, and they listened with respect. There will be many black men at Goldie, more than you ever believed possible. Zulus and Hosas 
and Nadebalis and Swazis and Nyasas, fifty different tribes, speaking so many different languages that you have never heard before. Tribes as different from you as you are different from the white man. Some of them will be traditional blood enemies of our tribe, waiting and watching like hyenas for a chance to turn upon you and savage you. There will be times when you are deep in the earth, down there where it is always night, that you will be at the mercy of such men. To protect yourselves, you must surround yourselves with men you can trust. You must place yourself under the protection of a strong leader, and in return for this protection, you must give this Sheftain your obedience and loyalty. And very soon they came to recognize that Moses Gama was this strong leader. Within days, he was the undisputed Sheftain of all the men in Coach 3, and while he was talking to them and answering their queries, stilling their fears and misgivings, Moses was, in his turn, assessing their individual worth, watching and weighing each of them, selecting, evaluating, and discarding. He began to rearrange the seating in the coach, ordering those whom he had chosen to move closer to his own seat in the center, gathering around him the pick of the recruits. And immediately the men he had singled out gained prestige. They formed an elite Praetorian guard around their new emperor. Hendrik watched him doing it, manipulating the men around him subjecting them to the force of his will and personality, and he was filled with admiration and pride for his younger brother, giving up his own last reservations and willingly according to him his full loyalty and love and obedience. By association with Moses, Henrik himself was accorded the respect and veneration of the other men in the coach. He was Moses' captain and henchman, and they recognized him as such. And quite slowly it dawned upon Hendrik that in a few short days Moses Gama had forged himself an impi, a band of warriors on whom he could reply implicitly, and that he had done it with almost no apparent effort. Sitting in the crowded coach that was already stinking like an animal cage with the rancid sweat of a hundred hot bodies and with the stench from the latrine cubicle, and mesmerized by the messianic eyes and words of his own brother, Hendrik thought back to the other great black rulers who had emerged from the mists of African history, to lead first a tiny band, then a tribe, and finally a vast horde of warriors across the continent, ravaging and plundering and laying waste. He thought of Mantatizi and Shaka and Mazilizakazi, of Shangan and Angoni, and with a flash of clairvoyance he saw them at their beginnings, sitting like this at some remote campfire in the wilderness, surrounded by a small group of men, weaving the spell over them, capturing their imagination and spirit with a silken noose of words and ideas, inflaming them with dreams. I stand at the beginning of an enterprise which I do not yet understand, he thought. All I have done up till this time was only my initiation. All the fighting and killing and striving was but a training. Now I am ready for the endeavor, whatever it may be, and Moses Gama will lead me to it. I do not need to know what it is. It is sufficient only that I follow where it leads. And he was listening avidly, as Moses spoke names that he had never heard, and expounded ideas that were new and strangely exciting. Lenin, said Moses, was not a man, but a god come down to earth. And they thrilled to the tale of a land to the north, where the tribes had united under this man-god, Lenin, had smitten down a king, and in doing so, had become part of the godhead themselves. They were enchanted and aroused as he told them of a war such as the earth had never seen before, and their atavistic battle-lust scalded their veins and pumped up their hearts, hard and hot, 
as the head of the fighting axe when it comes red and glowing from the ironsmith's forge. The revolution, Moses called this war, and as he explained it to them, they saw that they could be part of this glorious battle. They too could be slayers of kings and become part of the Godhead. 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 The door at the head of the coach crashed back on its slide, and the white overseer stepped through and stood with his hands on his hips, grinning mirthlessly at them, and they lowered their heads and stared at the floor, hooding and screening their eyes. But those sitting close to Moses, the chosen ones, the elite, they began to understand then where the battle would be fought, and who were the kings that would be slain. The white overseer sensed the charged atmosphere in the coach. It was thick as the odour of unwashed black bodies and the stink of the latrine in the corner of the coach. It was as electric as the air at noon in the suicide days of November, just before the great rains break. And he searched quickly for Hendrik, sitting in the centre of the coach. One rotten potato, he thought bitterly, and the whole sackful is spoiled. He touched the billy club in his belt. He had found out the difficult way that the lash of the jambok was too long to wield effectively in the confines of the coaches. The billy was a stopper, fourteen inches of hard wood, the end drilled and filled with lead shot. He could break bone with it, crush in a skull to kill a man instantly if he needed to, or, with a delicate alteration of the weight of the blow, merely stun him. He was an artist with the billy club, as he was with the jambok. But each had its place and time. It was the billy's time now. And he moved slowly down the coach, pretending to ignore Hendrik, examining the faces of each of the other men as he passed, seeing the new rebelliousness in their sullen faces, and becoming more angry with the man who had made his task more difficult. I should have gone after him at the beginning, he told himself bitterly. I have almost left it too late. Me, who loves the quiet life and the easy way. Well, we'll have to make the best of it now. He glanced casually at Hendrik as he passed, and then, from the corner of his eye, saw the big Vambo relax slightly as he went on down the aisle between the seats. You are expecting it, my boy, he thought. You know it has to happen, and I'm not going to disappoint you. At the far end of the coach he paused, as if he had had an afterthought, and he came back down the aisle slowly, grinning to himself. Now he stopped in front of Hendrik again, and sucked noisily at the cavity in his tooth. Look at me, Kaffer, he invited pleasantly, and Hendrik lifted his chin and stared at him. Which is your mpale? he asked. Which is your luggage? And Hendrik was taken off guard. He was acutely conscious of the treasure of diamonds in the rack above his head, and now he glanced up at the leather sack instinctively. Good. The white overseer lifted the sack off the rack and dropped it onto the floor in front of Hendrik. Open it, he ordered, still grinning, one hand on his hip, the other on the handle of the billy. Come on! The grin became cold and wolfish as Hendrik sat without moving. Open it, Kaffer! Let's see what you are hiding! It had never failed him yet. Even the most docile of men would react to protect their belongings, no matter how worthless and insignificantly. Slowly, Hendrik leaned forward and untied the neck of the leather sack. Then he straightened again and sat passively. 
The white overseer stooped, seized the bottom of the sack, and straightened up again, never taking his eyes off Hendrick's face. He shook the sack vigorously, spilling the contents onto the floor. The blanket roll fell out first, and using the toe of his boot, the overseer spread it open. There was a sheepskin gilet and the other spare clothing in the roll, and a nine-inch knife in a leather sheath. Dangerous weapon, said the overseer. You know that no dangerous weapons are allowed in the coaches. He picked up the knife, pressed the blade into the niche of the window, and snapped it off. Then he tossed the two separate pieces out between the bars of the window behind Hendrick's head. Hendrick did not move, although the overseer waited for almost a minute, staring at him provocatively. The only sound was the clackety clack of the bogey over the cross ties of the steel lines, and the faint huffing of the locomotive at the head of the train. None of the other black passengers was watching the small drama develop. They were all staring straight ahead of them, faces closed. Eyes unseen. What is this rubbish? The overseer asked and touched one of the hard, flat millet cakes with his toe. And though Hendrick did not move a muscle, the white man saw the first spark in those black, smoky eyes. Yes, he thought gleefully. That's it. Now he will move. And he picked up a loaf and sniffed it thoughtfully. Kaffir bread, he murmured. Not allowed. Company rules. No food allowed on the train. And he turned the flat loaf on edge, so that it would pass between the bars, and he tossed it through the open window. The loaf bounced on the embankment below the racketing steel wheels and then shattered into fragments. And the overseer chuckled, and stooped for the next loaf. It snapped in Hendrick's head. He had held it in check too long, and the loss of the diamonds drove him berserk. He went for the white man, launching himself out of the seat, but the overseer was ready for him. He straightened his right arm and drove the point of the billy club into Hendrick's throat. Then, as Hendrick fell back, choking and clutching at his throat, he whipped the club into the front of his skull, judging it finally not a killing blow, and Hendrick's hand dropped from his damaged throat as he toppled forward. However, the overseer would not let him fall, and with his left hand shoved him back against the seat, holding him upright while he worked with the club. It rang like an axe on wood. As it bounced off the bone of Hendrick's skull, and it opened the thin skin of his scalp, and the blood sprang up in little ruby bright fountains. The overseer hit him three times, measured, calculated blows, and then he thrust the point of the club into Hendrick's slack, gaping mouth, snapping off both his incisor teeth level with the gums. Always mark them. It was one of his maxims: mark them so they don't forget. Only then did he release the unconscious man and let him topple headfirst into the centre of the aisle. Instantly, he whipped around and poised on his toes like a puff adder, cocking itself into th the threatening S of the strike. With the billy club ready in his right hand, he stared down the shocked eyes of the black men around him. Quickly, they dropped their gaze from his, and the only movement was the jerking of their bodies in time to the swaying clatter of the coach beneath them. Hendrick's blood was puddling under his head, then running in little dark red snakes across the floor of the aisle. The overseer smiled again, looking down with an almost paternal expression at the recumbent figure. It had been a beautiful performance, quick and complete, exactly as he had planned it, and he had enjoyed it.
The man at his feet was his own creation, and he was proud of it. He picked up the other millet loaves out of the blood puddle, and one at a time tossed them out between the bars of the window. Finally, he squatted over the man at his feet, and on the back of his shirt carefully wiped the last traces of blood from his billy. Then he stood up, replaced the club in his belt, and walked slowly down the aisle. It was all right now. The mood had changed. The atmosphere was defused. There would be no more trouble. He had done his job, and done it well. He went out onto the balcony of the coach and, smiling thinly, locked the sliding door behind him again. The moment the door closed, the men in the carriage came back to life. Moses gave his orders crisply, and two of them lifted Hendrik back into his seat. Another went to the water tank beside the latrine door, while Moses opened his own pack and brought out a stoppered buckhorn. While they steadied Hendrik's lolling head, Moses poured a brown powder from the buckhorn into the wounds in his scalp. It was a mixture of ash and herbs, powdered finely, and he rubbed it into the open flesh with his finger. The bleeding stopped, and with a wet cloth he cleaned his brother's broken mouth. Then he cradled his unconscious head in his arms and waited. Moses had watched the conflict between his brother and the white man with almost clinical interest, deliberately re restraining and directing Hendrik's reaction until the drama had reached this explosive climax. His attachment to his brother was still tenuous. Their father had been a prosperous and lusty man and had brought all of his fifteen wives regularly to the child bed. Moses had over thirty brothers and sisters. Towards very few of them he felt any special affection beyond vague tribal and family duty. Hendrik was many years his senior, and had left the kraal when Moses was still a child. Since then the tales of his exploits had filtered back to him, and Hendrik's reputation had grown on these accounts of wild and desperate deeds. But tales are only tales until they are proven, and reputations can be built on words and not deeds. The testing time was at hand. Moses would consider the results of the test, and upon them would depend their future relationship. He needed a hard man as his lieutenant, one of the steely men. Lenin had chosen Joseph Stalin. He would choose a man of steel also, a man like an axe, and with him as a weapon he would hack and shape his own plans out of the hard wood of the future. If Hendrik failed the test, Moses would toss him aside with as little compassion as he would an axe whose blade had shattered at the first stroke against the trunk of a tree. Hendrik opened his eyes and looked at his brother with dilated pupils. He moaned and touched the open wounds on his scalp. He winced at the pain, and his pupils shrank and focused, and the rage flamed in their depths as he struggled upright. The diamonds! His voice was low and sibilant, as the hiss of one of those deadly little horned adders of the desert. Gone, Moses told him quietly. We must go back, find them. But Moses shook his head. They are scattered like the seeds of the grass. There is no way to mark their fall. No, my brother, we are prisoners in this coach. We cannot go back. The diamonds are lost for ever. Hendrik sat quietly, with his tongue exploring his shattered mouth, running it over the jagged stumps of his front teeth, considering his brother's cold logic. Moses waited quietly. This time he would give no orders, point no direction, no matter how subtle. Hendrik must come out of it by his own accord. You are right, my brother, 
Hendrick said at last. The diamonds are gone. But I am going to kill the man that did this to us. Moses showed no emotion. He offered no encouragement. He merely waited. I will do it with cunning. I will find a way to kill him, and no man will ever know except him and us. Still, Moses waited. So far, Hendrik was taking the path that he had laid out for him. However, there was still something else he must do. He waited for it, and it came as he had hoped it would. Do you agree that I should kill this white dog, my brother? He had asked for sanction from Moses Gama. He had acknowledged his liege lord, placed himself in his brother's hands. And Moses smiled and touched his brother's arm, as though he were placing a mark, a brand of approval upon him. Do it, my brother, he ordered. If he failed, the white men would hang him on a rope. If he succeeded, he would have proved himself an axe, a steely man. Hendrik brooded darkly in his seat, not speaking for another hour. Occasionally massaging his temples, where the throbbing pain of the blows threatened to burst his skull open. Then he rose and moved slowly down the coach, examining each of the barred windows, shaking his head and muttering at the pain. He returned to his seat and sat there for a while, and then rose once again and shuffled down the aisle to the latrine cubicle. He locked himself into the cubicle. There was an open hole in the deck, and through it he could see the rushing blur of the stone embankment below the coach. Many of the men using the latrine had missed the hole, and the floor slopped with dark yellow urine and splattered faeces. Hendrik turned his attention to the single unglazed window. The opening was covered with steel mesh in a wire frame, which was screwed into a wooden frame at each corner and at the centre of each side. He returned to his seat in the carriage and whispered to Moses, the white baboon took my knife. I need another. Moses asked no questions. It was part of the test. Hendrik must do it alone, and if he failed, accept the full consequences, without expecting Moses to share them or attempt to aid him. He spoke quietly to the men around him, and within a few minutes a clasp knife was passed down the bench and slipped into Hendrik's hand. He returned to the latrine and worked on the retaining screws of the wire frame, careful not to scratch the paintwork around them or leave any sign that they had been tampered with. He removed all eight screws, eased the frame from its seating and set it aside. He waited until the tracks made a right-hand bend, judging by the centrifugal force against his body as the coach turned under him and then he glanced out of the open window. The train was turning away from him, the leading coaches and the goods vans out of sight around the bend ahead, and he leaned out of the window and looked up. There was a combing along the edge of the roof of the coach. He reached up and ran his fingers over the ridge and found a handhold. He raised himself, putting his full weight upon it, hanging on his arms, only his feet still inside the latrine window, and the rest of his body suspended outside. He lifted his eyes to the level of the roof and memorized the slope and layout of the top of the coach. Then he lowered himself again and ducked back into the latrine. He replaced the mesh over the window, but turned the screws only finger tight, then went back to his seat in the coach. In the early evening, the white overseer and his two boss boys came through the coach with the food barrow. When he reached Henrik, he smiled at him without rancour. You are beautiful now, Kaffer. 
The black maids will love to kiss that mouth. He turned and addressed these silent ranks of black men. If any of you want to be beautiful also, just let me know. I will do it for free. Just before dark, the boss boys came back to collect the empty dishes. Tomorrow night you will be at Goldie, one of them told Henrik. There is a white doctor there who will treat your wounds. There was a hint of sympathy in his impassive black face. It was not wise of you to anger Tshela, the striker. You have learned a hard lesson, friend. Remember it well, all of you. He locked the door as he left the coach. Hendrik gazed out of the window at the sunset. In four days of travel, the landscape had changed entirely, as they had climbed up onto the plateau of the high veld. The grasslands were pale brown, seared by the black frosts of winter. The red earth gouged open with dongers of erosion, and divided into geometrical camps with barbed wire. The isolated homesteads seemed forlorn upon the open veld, with the steel-framed windmills standing like gaunt sentinels over them. And the lean cattle were long-horned and party-coloured, red and black and white. Hendrik, who had lived his life in the unpeopled wilderness, found the fences cramping and restrictive. In this place, you could never be out of sight of other men or their works, and the villages they passed were as sprawling and populous as Vindhoek, the biggest town he had ever conceived of. Wait until you see Goldie, Moses told him, as the darkness fell outside, and the men around them settled down for the night, wrapping their blankets over their heads, for the chill of the high veld blew in through the open windows. Hendrik waited until the white overseer made his first round of the coaches, and when he shone the beam of his lantern into Hendrik's face, made no attempt to feign sleep. But blinked up at him blindly. The overseer passed on, locking the door as he left the coach. Hendrik rose quietly in the seat. Opposite him, Moses stirred in the darkness but did not speak, and Hendrik went down the aisle and locked himself in the latrine. Quickly, he loosened the screws and worked the frame off its seating. He set it against the bulkhead and leaned out of the window. The cold night air buffeted his head, and he slitted his eyes against the hot smuts that blew back from the coal-burning locomotive and stung his cheeks and forehead, as he reached up and found his handholds on the ridge of the combing. He drew himself upward smoothly, and then, with a kick and a heave, flung the top half of his body over the edge of the roof and shot out one arm. He found a grip on the ventilator in the middle of the curved roof, and pulled himself the rest of the way on his belly. He lay for a while panting and with his eyes tightly closed, until he got control of the pounding ache in his head. Then he raised himself to his knees, and began crawling forward towards the leading edge of the roof. The night sky was clear. The land was silver with starlight and blue with shadow, and the wind roared about his head. He rose to his feet and balanced against the lurch and sway of the coach. With his feet wide apart and his knees bent, he moved forward. A premonition of danger made him look up, and he saw the dark shape rush at him out of the darkness. And he threw himself flat, just as the steel arm of one of the railway water towers flashed over his head. A second later, it would have decapitated him, and he shivered with the cold and the shock of near death. After a minute, he gathered himself and crawled forward again, not raising his head more than a few inches, until he reached the front edge of the roof. He lay spread eagled on his belly and cautiously peered over the edge. The balconies of the joining coaches were below him, the gap between the roof. About the span of one of his arms, directly under him, the footplates articulated against each other as the train clattered through the curves of the line. 
Anybody moving from one coach to the next must pass below where Hendrik lay. And he grunted with satisfaction and looked behind him. One of the ventilator pots was just level with his feet as he lay outstretched. He crawled back, drawing the heavy leather belt from the top of his breeches, and buckled it around the ventilator, forming a loop into which he thrust one of his feet as far as the ankle. Once again he stretched out onto the roof, one foot securely anchored by the loop, and he reached down into the space between the coaches. He could just touch the banisters of the guard fence around the balcony. Electric bulbs in wire cages were fixed to the overhang of the balconies, so the area below him was well lit. He drew back and lay flat on the roof, only the top of his head and his eyes showing from below. But he knew that the lights would dazzle anybody who looked upwards into the gap between the roofs, and he settled down to wait like a leopard in the tree over the waterhole. An hour passed, and then another. But he judged the passage of time only by the slow rotation of the stars across the night sky. He was stiff and freezing cold as the wind thrashed his unprotected body. But he bore it stoically, never allowing himself to doze or lose concentration. Waiting was always a major part of the hunt, of the game of death, and he had played this game a hundred times before. Suddenly, even over the rush of the train's passage and the rhythm of the cross ties, he heard the click of steel on steel and the rattle of keys in the lock of the door below him, and he gathered himself. The man would step over the footplates as quickly as he could, not wanting to be in that vulnerable and exposed position for a moment longer than was necessary to make the crossing. And Hendrik would have to be quicker still. He heard the sliding door slam back against the jam, and the lock turn again. Then, an instant later, the crown of the white overseer's hat appeared below him. Instantly, Hendrik shot his body forward and dropped as far as his waist into the gap between the coaches. Only the leather belt around his ankle anchored him. Lothar had taught him the double lock, and he whipped one arm around the white man's neck and braced his other hand in the crook of his own elbow, catching the man's head in the vice of his arms, and jerked him off his feet. The white man made a strangled, cawing sound, and droplets of spittle flew from his lips, sparkling in the electric light as Hendrik drew him upwards as though he were hoisted on the gallows tree. The white man's hat fell from his head and flitted away into the night like a black bat, and he was kicking and twisting his body violently, clawing at the thick muscled arms that were locked around his neck, his long blonde hair fluttering and tumbling in the night wind. Hendrik lifted him until their eyes were inches apart, and he smiled into his face exposing the mangled black pit of his own mouth, his shattered front teeth still stained with clotted blood. And in the reflection of the balcony lights, the white man recognised him. Hendrik saw the recognition flare in his pale, dilated eyes. Yes, my friend, he whispered. It is me, the Kaffir. He drew the man up another inch and wedged the back of his neck against the edge of the roof. Then, very deliberately, he put pressure on his spine at the base of his skull. The white man writhed and struggled like a fish on the barbs of the harpoon, but Hendrik held him easily, staring deep into his eyes, and bent his neck backwards, lifting with his forearm under the chin. Hendrik felt the spine loading and locking, at the pressure. It could give no more, and for a second longer he held him at the breaking point. Then, with a jerk, he pushed the man's chin up another inch, and the spine snapped like a dry branch. The white man danced in the air, twitching and shuddering, and Hendrik watched the pale blue eyes glaze over, becoming opaque and lifeless. And over the rush of the wind, he heard the soft, spluttering release as his sphincter muscle relaxed and his bowels involuntarily voided. 
Hendrick swung his dangling corpse like a pendulum, and as it cleared the balcony rail, he let it drop into the gap between the coaches, directly into the track of the racing wheels. It was sucked away by the spinning steel, like a scrap of meat into the blades of a mincing machine. He lay for a moment, recovering his breath. He knew that the overseer's mutilated corpse would be smeared over half a mile of the railway tracks. He untied his belt from the ventilator and buckled it around his waist. Then he crawled back along the roof of the coach until he was directly above the latrine window. He lowered his feet over the sill and, with a twist, dropped into the cubicle. He replaced the mesh frame over the window and tightened the screws. He went back down the coach to his seat, and Moses Garmer was watching him as he wrapped the blanket around his shoulders. He nodded at his brother, and pulled the corner of the blanket over his head. Within minutes, he was asleep. Sleep. 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 He was awakened by the shouts of the bus boys and the jolting of the coach as it was shunted off the main line. He saw the name of the small village where they had stopped painted on a white board on the platform, Vryburg, but it meant nothing to him. Soon the platform and the coaches were invaded by blue uniformed railway police. And all the recruits were ordered out onto the platform. They lined up, shivering and sleepy under the floodlights, answered to the roll call. Everyone was present. Hendrick nudged his brother, and with his chin pointed at the wheels and bogey below their coach. The hubs and axles were splattered with blood and tiny slivers and particles of raw red flesh and tissue. All the following day, the coaches stood in the siding, while the police individually subjected each of the recruits to a hectoring interrogation in the station master's office. By mid-afternoon, it was obvious that they were coming to accept that the overseer's death was accidental, and were losing interest in the investigation. The evidence of the locked doors and barred windows was convincing. And the testimony of the boss boys and every one of the recruits was unanimous and unshakable. In the late afternoon, they were loaded back into the coaches, and they rumbled on into the night towards the fabulous ridge of white waters. Hendrick woke to the excited chatter of the men around him, and when he shouldered his way to the crowded window, the first thing he saw was a high mountain, so big. That it blocked the sky to the north, a strange and wonderful mountain glowing with a pearly yellow light in the early sun, a mountain with a perfectly flat top, and symmetrical sloping sides. What kind of mountain is this? Hendrik marvelled. A mountain taken from the belly of the earth, Moses told him. That is a mine dump, my brother. A mountain built by men from the rocks they dig up from below. Wherever Hendrik looked, there were these flat-topped, shining dumps scattered across the undulating grassland, or standing along the skyline. And near each of them stood tall giraffes of steel, long-necked and skeletal, with giant wheels for heads, that spun endlessly against the pale, high-velt sky. Headgears, Moses told him. Below each of those is a hole that reaches down into the guts of the world, into the rock bowels that hold the yellow goldy, for which the white men sweat and then lie and cheat, and often kill. As the train ran on, they saw wonder followed by wonder, taller buildings than they had ever believed possible. Roads that ran like rivers of steel with growling vehicles, tall chimneys that filled the sky with black thunderclouds, and multitudes upon multitudes, human beings more numerous than the springbok migrations of the Kalahari, black men in silver helmets and knee-high rubber boots, regiments of them, 
marching towards the tall headgears, or, as the shifts changed, wearily swarming back from the shafts, splashed from head to foot with yellow mud. There were white men on the streets and platforms, white women in gaily coloured dresses, with remote disdainful expressions, human beings in the windows of the buildings which crowded wall to red brick wall right to the verge of the railway tracks. It was all too much, too huge and diffuse for them to assimilate at one time, and they gaped and exclaimed and pressed to the windows of the coach. Where are the women? Hendrik asked suddenly, and Moses smiled. Which women, brother? The black women, the women of our tribe. There are no women here, not the type of women you know, said Moses. There are only the Isifebi, and they do it for gold. Everything here is for gold. Once again they were shunted off the main line into a fenced enclosure in which the long white barrack buildings stood in endless rows, and the signboard above the gates read, Whitwater's Rand Native Labour Association, Central Rand Induction Centre. From the coaches they were led to a long shed by a couple of grinning boss boys and instructed to strip to the buff. The lines of naked black men shuffled forward under the paternal eyes of the boss boys, who treated them in a friendly, jocular fashion. Some of you have brought your livestock with you, they joked. Goats on your scalp and cattle in your pubic hairs. And dipping the paintbrushes they wielded into buckets of blue butter ointment, they plastered the heads and crotches of the recruits. Rub it in, they ordered. We don't want your lice and crabs and itchy crawlers. And the recruits entered into the spirit of the occasion and roared with laughter as they smeared each other with the sticky butter. At the end of the shed, they were each handed a small square of blue mottled carbolic soap. Your mothers may think you smell like the mimosa in flower, but even the goats shudder when you pass upwind. The boss boys laughed and shoved them under the hot showers. The doctors were waiting for them when they emerged, scrubbed and still naked, and this time the medical examinations were exhaustive. Their chests were sounded, and all their bodily apertures probed and scrutinised. What happened to your mouth and your head? One doctor demanded of Hendrik. No, don't tell me, I don't want to know. He had seen injuries like these before. Those bloody animals in charge of the trains, he said. All right, we will send you to the dentist to have those stumps pulled. Too late to stitch the head. You'll have a couple of lovely scars. Apart from that, you are a beauty. He slapped Hendrick's hard, shiny black muscles. We'll put you down for underground work, and you'll get the underground bonus. They were issued grey overalls and hobnail boots, and then given a gargantuan meal, as much as they could eat. It is not like I thought it would be, Hendrik spooned stew into his mouth. Good food, white men who smile, no beatings, not like the train. Brother, only a fool starves and beats his own oxen, said Moses. And these white men are not fools. One of the other Avambo men took Moses' empty dish to the kitchen and returned with it refilled. It was no longer necessary for him to give orders for such menial services. His wants were taken care of by the men around him as if by birthright. Already the death of the white overseer, Sheela the striker, have been embroidered and built into legend by many repetitions, reinforcing the stature and authority of Moses Gama and his lieutenant. Men walked softly around them and inclined their heads respectfully when either Moses or Hendrik spoke directly to them. At dawn the next morning, 
they were roused from their bunks in the barrack rooms, and after a huge breakfast of maize cake and mass, the thick clotted sour milk, they were led to the long iron roofed classroom. Men of forty different tribes come from every corner of the land to Goldie. Men speaking forty different languages, from Zulu to Tswana, from Herero to Basuto, and only one in a thousand of them understands a word of English or of Afrikaans. Moses explained softly to his brother, as the other men respectfully made room for them on one of the classroom benches. Now they will teach us the special language of Goldie, the tongue by which all men, whether black or white, and of whatever tribe, speak to each other here. A venerable old Zulu boss boy, his pate covered with a cap of shining silver wool, was their instructor in the lingua franca of the gold mines, Fanaculo. The name was taken from its own vocabulary and meant literally, like this, like that the phrase that the recruits would have urged upon them frequently over the weeks ahead. Do it like this. Work like that. Sabenza Fanacolo. The Zulu instructor on the raised dais was surrounded by all the accoutrements of the miner's trade, set out on display so that he could touch each item with his pointer and the recruits would chant the name of it in unison. Helmets and lanterns, hammers and picks, jumper bars and scrapers, safety rails and rigs, they would know them all intimately before they stood their first shift. But now the old Zulu touched his own chest and said, Mina, then pointed at his class and said, Buena, and Moses led them in the chant, Me, you. Head, said the instructor, and arm, and leg, he touched his own body, and his pupils imitated him enthusiastically. They worked at the language all that morning, and then after lunch, they were divided into groups of twenty, and the group that included Moses and Henrik was taken to another iron-roofed building similar to the language classroom. It differed only in its furnishings. Long trestle tables ran from wall to wall and the person that welcomed them was a white man with a peculiar bright ginger-coloured hair and moustache and green eyes. He was dressed in a long white coat, like those the doctors had worn, and like them he was smiling and friendly, waving them to their places at the tables and speaking in English that only Moses and Hendrik understood, although they were careful not to make their understanding apparent and maintained a pantomime of perplexity and ignorance. All right, you fellows. My name is Dr. Marcus Archer, and I am a psychologist. What we are going to do now is to give you an aptitude test to see just what kind of work you are best suited to. The white man smiled at them, and then nodded to the boss boy beside him, who translated. You do what Bomvu, the Red One, tells you. That way we can find out just how stupid you are. The first test was a block-building exercise which Marcus Archer had developed himself to test basic manual dexterity and awareness of mechanical shape. The multicoloured wooden blocks of various shapes had to be fitted into the frame on the table in front of each subject, in the manner of an elementary jigsaw puzzle, and the time allotted for completion was six minutes. The boss boy explained the procedure and gave a demonstration, and the recruits took their seats at the tables, and Marcus Archer called, Enza, do it, and started his stopwatch. Moses completed his puzzle in one minute six seconds. According to Dr. Archer's meticulous records, to date, 116,816 had sat this particular test. Not one of them had completed it in under two and a half minutes. He left the dais and went down to Moses' table to check his assembly of the blocks. It was correct. And he nodded and studied Moses' expressionless features thoughtfully. Of course, 
he had noticed Moses the moment he entered the room. He had never seen such a beautiful man in his life, either black or white, and Dr. Archer's preference was strongly for black skin. That was one of the main reasons he had come out to Africa five years before, for Dr. Marcus Archer was a homosexual. He had been in his third year at Magdalen College before he admitted this fact to himself, and the man who had introduced him to the bittersweet delights had, at the same time, stimulated his intellect with the wondrous new doctrines of Karl Marx, and the subsequent refinements of, to that doctrine by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. His lover had secretly enrolled him in the British Communist Party, and after he had left Cambridge. Introduced him to the comrades of Bloomsbury. However, the young Marcus had never felt entirely at home in intellectual London. He had lacked the spiked tongue, the ready acid wit, and the feline cruelty. And after a short and highly unsatisfactory affair with Lytton Strachey, he had been given Lytton's notorious treatment and ostracised from the group. He had banished himself into the wilderness of Manchester University to take up the new science of industrial psychology. In Manchester, he had begun a long and lyrically happy liaison with the Jamaican trombone player, and allowed his connections with the party to fall into neglect. However, he was to learn that the party never forgets its chosen ones, and at the age of thirty-one. When he had already made some small reputation for himself in his profession, but when his association with his Jamaican lover had ended acrimoniously, and he was dejected and almost suicidal, the party had reached out one of its tentacles and drawn him gently back into the fold. They told him that there was an opening in his field with the South African Chamber of Mines, working with African mine workers. His penchant for black skin was by now an addiction. The infant South African Communist Party was in need of bolstering, and the job was his if he wanted. It was implied that he had free choice in the matter, but the outcome was never in doubt, and within a month he had sailed for Cape Town. In the following five years, he had done important pioneering work with the Chamber of Mines. And had received both recognition and deep satisfaction from it. His connections with the party had been carefully concealed, but the covert work he had done in this area was even more important. And his commitment to the ideals of Marxism had grown stronger as he grew older, and saw at first hand the inhumanities of class and racial discrimination, the terrible abyss that separated the poor and dispossessed black pro proletariat. From the enormous wealth and privilege of the white bourgeoisie, he had found that in this rich and beautiful land, all the gross ills of the human condition flourished as though in a hot house, exaggerated until they were almost a caricature of evil. Now Marcus Archer looked at this noble young man, with the face of an Egyptian god and a skin of burnt honey. And he was filled with longing. You speak English, don't you? He asked, and Moses nodded. Yes, I do, he said softly. And Marcus Archer had to turn away and go back to his dais. His passion was impossible to disguise, and his fingers were trembling as he took up a stick of chalk and wrote upon the blackboard, giving himself a respite to get his emotions under control. The tests continued for the rest of the afternoon, the subjects gradually being sorted and channeled into their various grades and levels on the results. At the end, only one remained in the mainstream. Moses Gama had completed the progressively more difficult tests with the same aplomb as he had tackled the first, and Doctor Archer realized that he had discovered a prodigy. At five o'clock, the session ended. And thankfully, the subjects trooped from the classroom. The last hour had taxed even the brightest among them. Moses alone had remained undaunted, 
and as he filed past the desk, Dr. Archer said, Gama. He had taken the name from the register. There is one more task I would like you to attempt. He led Moses down the veranda to his office at the end. You can read and write, Gama? Yes, Doctor. It is a theory of mine that a man's handwriting can be studied to find the key to his personality, Archer explained. And I would like you to write for me. They sat side by side at the desk, and Dr. Archer sat writing materials in front of Moses, chatting easily. This is a standard text I use. On the card he handed Moses was printed the nursery rhyme, The Cat and the Fiddle. Moses dipped the pen, and Archer leaned closer to watch. His writing was large and fluent, the characters formed with sharp peaks, forward sloping, and definite. All the indications of mental determination and ruthless energy were present. Still studying the handwriting, Archer casually laid his hand upon Moses' thigh, intensely aware of the hard, rubbery muscle beneath the velvety skin. And the nib spluttered as Moses started. Then his hand steadied, and he went on writing. He finished, laid the pen down carefully, and for the first time looked directly into Marcus Archer's green eyes. Gamma. Marcus Archer's voice shook, and his fingers tightened. You are much too intelligent to waste your time shoveling ore. He paused and moved his hand slowly up Moses' leg. Moses stared steadily into his eyes. His expression did not change, but he let his thighs fall slowly open, and Marcus Archer's heart was thumping wildly against his ribs. I want you to work as my personal assistant, Gamma he whispered, and Moses considered the magnitude of this offer. He would have access to the files of every worker in the gold mining industry. He would be protected and privileged, free to pass and enter where other black men were forbidden. The advantages were so numerous that he knew he could not grasp them all in so brief a moment. For the man who made the offer he felt almost nothing, neither revulsion nor desire but he wouldn't have no compunction in paying the price he demanded. If the white man wished to be treated as a woman, then Moses would readily render him this service. Yes, doctor, I would like to work for you, he said. On the last night in the barrack room of the induction centre, Moses called all his chosen lieutenants to him. They clustered around his bunk. Very soon you will go from here to the Goldie, he said. Not all of you will go together, for there are many mines along the Rand. Some of you will go down into the earth, others will work on the surface in the mills and the reduction plants. We will be separated for a while, but you will not forget that we are brothers. I, your elder brother, will not forget you. I have important work for you. I will seek you out, wherever you are, and you will be ready for me when I summon you. Hey, hey! They grunted in agreement and obedience. We are your younger brothers. We will listen for your voice. Moses went on. You must know always that you are under my protection, that all trespasses against you will be revenged. You have seen what happens to those who give offence to our brotherhood. We have seen it, they murmured. We have seen it, and it is death. It is death, Moses confirmed. It is death also for any of the brotherhood who betray us. It is death for all traitors. Death to all traitors! They chanted and swayed together, coming once more under the mesmeric spell which Moses' Gama wove about them. I have chosen a totem for our brotherhood, 
Moses went on. I have chosen the buffalo for our totem, for he is black and powerful, and all men fear him. We are the buffaloes. We are the buffaloes, they chanted. Already they were proud of the distinction. We are the black buffaloes, and all men will learn to fear us. These are the signs, said Moses, the secret signs by which we all recognize our own. He made the sign, and then individually clasped their right hands in the fashion of the white man. But the grip was different, a double grip and a turn of the second finger. Thus you will know your brothers when they come to you. They greeted each other in the darkened barracks, each of them shaking the hand of all the others in the new way. And it was a form of initiation into the brotherhood. You will hear from me soon, said Moses. Until I call, you must do as the white man requires of you. You must work hard and learn. You must be ready for the call when it comes. Moses sent them away to their bunks, and he and Hendrik sat alone, their heads together speaking in whispers. You have lost the little white stones, Moses told him. By now the birds and the small beasts will have pecked the loaves and devoured the millet bread. The stones will be scattered and lost, the dust will cover them, and the grass will grow over them. They are gone, my brother. Yes, they are gone, Hendrik lamented, after so much blood and striving, after all the hardships we endured, they have been scattered like seeds to the wind. They were accursed, Moses consoled him. From the moment I saw them, I knew that they would bring only disaster and death. They are white man's toys. What could you have done with the white man's wealth? If you tried to spend it, if you tried to buy white man's things with it, you would instantly have been marked by the white police. They would have come for you immediately, and there would have been a rope or a jail cell for you. Hendrik was silent, considering the truth of this. What could he have purchased with the stones? Black men could not own their own land. More than a hundred head of cattle, and the local chieftain's envy would have been aroused. He already had all the wives, and more, that he wished for, and black men did not drive in motor cars. Black men did not draw attention to themselves in any way, not if they were wise. No, my brother, Moses told him softly. They were not for you. Thank the spirits of your ancestors that they were wrested from you and scattered back on the earth where they belong. Hendrik growled softly. Still, it would have been good to have that treasure, to hold it in my hands even secretly. There are other treasures even more important than diamonds or white man's gold, my brother, said Moses. What are these treasures? Hendrik asked. Follow me, and I will lead you to them. But tell me what they are, Hendrik insisted. You will discover them in good time, Moses smiled. But now, my brother, we must talk of first things. The treasures will follow later. Listen to me. Bomvu, the red one, my little doctor who likes to be used as a woman, Bomvu has allocated you to the Goldie called Central Rand Consolidated. It is one of the richest of the Goldie, with many deep shafts. You will go underground, and it is best if you make a name for yourself there. I have prevailed on Bombu to send ten of our best men from the Buffaloes to CRC with you. These will be your impi, your chosen warriors. You must start with them, but you will build upon them, gathering around you the quick and strong and the fearless. What must I do with these men? asked Hendrik. Hold them in readiness. You will hear from me soon. Very soon. 
What of the other buffaloes? asked Henrik. Bombu has sent them, at my suggestion, in groups of ten to each of the other Goldie along the Rand. Small groups of our men everywhere. They will grow, and soon we will be a great black herd of buffaloes which even the most savage lion will not dare to challenge.